Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to CSIS on a cold morning. Uh, my name is Matthew Goodman. I hold the Simon Chair in Political Economy here at CSIS, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you here um, for this program on trade enforcement. Welcome to our online viewers as well. We uh, always have a good crowd, especially on a, a cold day like today. So um, uh, welcome. A uh, couple of administrative things, the usual, uh, please uh, silence your um, noisemakers or set them on stun. Um, uh, if there's any kind of uh, emergency, there are exits over here, follow me. We'll gather across the street. There's an alley in the back and we can go, uh, go out there and uh, over to the park across the street. Um, we're gonna take a break. We're gonna do um, Ambassador Froman and Jake Schlesinger first, their conversation, then go straight into the first panel. Then we will have a short coffee break uh, before the second panel. Uh, and there are restrooms sort of behind here. You can go out the glass doors to the right and around the back if you need those. And um, I think that's all the administrative uh, notices. Uh, oh, let me also thank Alcoa Foundation for their generous support of this uh, series um, uh, that we have on economic issues, including uh, this one today. We really appreciate that support. We couldn't do what we do without, um, without uh, support from um, people like Alcoa Foundation, so thank you. Um, so when we set up these events, we always do the months in advance. We plan these things months in advance, mainly because it's hard to book this uh, uh, space. Um, when we thought about this one, actually probably close to a year ago, I think we thought this was gonna be a sort of slightly wonky uh, issue um, that uh, would help uh, inform our general uh, CSAS audience about some of these interesting, uh, to us, trade walks, um, issues about enforcement of trade agreements. Uh, I don't think we knew quite how hot this topic was gonna be, um, and um, in particular because you have a, a bunch of um, potential enforcement cases here in U under US uh, law, a bunch of numbers that we're gonna talk about, sections 301, 201, 232, ones that we all studied in uh, either law school or in my case, grad school in trade law and uh, have forgotten uh, exactly what they, uh, what they do and uh, uh, we're, we're all learning ourselves or renewing all of that. Obviously the, the China story has kind of exploded in the last, uh, in the last uh, year or so, although it's been a gathering storm. Um, we're gonna talk about that. And then as we speak, uh, in fact, part of the reason that uh, this room isn't even twice as uh, packed as it, as it would be is a lot of people are down in Buenos Aires for the uh, ministerial conference, the WTO uh, ministerial conference, um, uh, talking about uh, these issues uh, among others, although uh, whether they're actually going to uh, resolve anything um, we're gonna discuss. Um, so it's a, a great opportunity to get a, a, a bunch of uh, really uh, brainy people together to talk about these issues and we certainly hope you will contribute uh, during the day. Um, with, uh, with all of that, uh, no further ado, let me introduce, uh, obviously everybody knows Ambassador Michael Froman, uh, who was USTR in the um, um, uh, Obama administration second term. In the first term, he was my boss at the NSC uh, where we worked together on a lot of these issues, including trade-related uh, issues, and uh, uh, Mike is, uh, is, is, I think, well-known to all of you, but, but, but somebody who knows a lot about trade enforcement uh, in a way that um, maybe people don't appreciate because I think they think of him as leading negotiations on, uh, on things like TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but actually in uh, the Transatlantic Partnership but a lot of uh, trade policy is about enforcement, and in fact, towards the end of the Obama administration, they were doing a lot of, uh, they were stepping up that activity, and I think I'm very interested in hearing uh, Mike's perspective on those issues. Uh, he's, he's gonna be joined in conversation with uh, Jacob Schlesinger. Jake, again, is well known to everybody as a, a senior correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. I think of him as a Japan guy, um, or as a good financial journalist. He's actually relatively new to the trade beat, uh, which is the perfect person to, uh, to do this kind of interview because he's smart, but learning himself, I think, if that's fair to say. So he's got good questions. So with that, uh, Mike and Jake, please come up. Thanks. Thanks, Matt, for that. Um, I think actually, I was just talking to Chuck Levy, I think at, at this point things are changing so much that we're probably all learning actually with what's going on, we don't really know. Um, so we're gonna, Mike and I are gonna talk up here for about half an hour and then we're gonna open it up to the audience for questions uh, for 10 or 15 minutes. 
Um, but Mike, I'd like to start by reading you a statement from Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, which was made for a recent trade enforcement announcement. And he said, and I quote, President Trump made a promise to American business workers and farmers that he would vigorously enforce our trade laws and be more enforcement minded than our predecessors. Today's action shows we intend to make good on that promise. So two questions, were you insufficiently enforcement minded and are they really more enforcement minded? Well, look, I think, uh, uh, first of all, I commend the current administration for its focus uh, on enforcement. I think it is uh, more continuity than change. I think uh, we were extremely focused on it as well. And I imagine if you did uh, more research, you would have found a very similar statement <laughs> by a previous Commerce Secretary or a previous president who said, we're going to enforce, we've promised to enforce the laws, and we're going to do so even more so than our, our predecessor. Um, I think over the course of the Obama administration, we brought 26 challenges at the WTO. I believe that's more than any other country. It's certainly uh, more than uh, our, our predecessor did. 16 of those were against China. We won every case that went to uh, conclusion. And of course, we defended some cases uh, too that were brought against us by other countries. Uh, we also uh, brought the first safeguard action uh, that, uh, under, uh, under the China accession agreement. Um, and there was continued to be, uh, uh, largely driven by petitioners, a very active anti-dumping and countervailing duty uh, agenda that, uh, uh, that also defined the, the enforcement agenda. So I think enforcement is absolutely critical. Um, I think the Trump administration um, uh, agrees with that, has continued that policy. And uh, of course, we're all eager to see how they actually put that into practice. So far, we haven't seen, we're, we're almost coming up on a year now, we haven't seen any new WTO cases uh, filed, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, in the, first, um, in the first year of the administration. We've seen some WTO cases inherited by the Trump administration that we started that they have yet to follow up on. So I do hope that when they talk about enforcement, they are as committed to putting their thoughts into action as they are to, uh, to ramping up the rhetoric on this. So just wanted to uh, follow that with a bit of an overview on the topic. So the premise of much of the conversation these days about trade, as Matt had alluded to, and indeed the focus of today's event, is that the US in general is not doing enough on enforcement or can and should be doing better. And as I see it, you, you could break that down into three kind of main areas, and I'd like you to address each of these briefly. So the options are A, we're not using as much as we should the existing tools in our current toolkit. B, the toolkit's out of date and we actually need new and better tools or C, the problem isn't really, or isn't only the enforcement tools, but the rules. After all, law enforcement officers can or, or should only enforce the laws that are on the books. So maybe the problem is that the laws or the global rules don't reflect current needs. So again, breaking those down into A, we should be using more of the current toolkit, B, we need more tools, or C, the problem is the rules, not the tools. How would you divide those three up and, and reflect on each of those? Probably the easiest answer is to say you know, D, all of the above. Um, uh, and I think there is an element uh, uh, of that. I mean, one, I think we do need to use all the tools um, at our disposal and, but, and use them in an appropriate way. If you bring cases under some of our trade laws that really aren't justified by the standards of those laws, you actually, in the long term, end up weakening your trade tools because other countries will challenge them. They will challenge them successfully. And that can be a problem. So uh, now it, you know, it's possible the previous administrations have been overly cautious. We've always wanted, we wanted to make sure if we brought a case that we were gonna win it. And we held ourselves to a pretty high standard, you know, 90% chance or higher at times that, that we'd wanna win, win a case. Um, there are those who say, well, maybe you shouldn't hold yourself to such a high standard. Bring more cases, take more of the risk that you lose them or that some of these tools get, um, get questioned and uh, undermined uh, in the international system. I think that's a judgment, uh, that, that's a judgment to be made. I think um, uh, on the second, on, on your, your point B, do we need more tools? Uh, theoretically, yes, um, although I have to say, as we've gone through various phases of legislation, including during the Obama administration, a, a customs and enforcement bill, um, we certainly looked to people to say, okay, what additional tools would you like to have? What isn't being done that, that should be done? And uh, there were some important changes made in those laws, particularly about Customs and Border uh, Protection, CBP, how they enforce uh, anti-dumping, countervailing duty uh, duties, making sure that they're collecting, dealing with transshipment, uh, 
things of that issue. So that I think is an ongoing process, um, uh, but it's not as though there's a large uh, group of, of, of tools that we have ignored. We have always asked what additional tools should we seek? And, um, uh, and I'll come back to one of those in, in, in a minute. Um, or, or probably in, in response to a future, a later question of yours, um, there probably are some additional tools we could use. I think the real, the, the most important thing that we can do is your point C. Um, I think what we have found is that uh, the, the, the WTO and the GATT before it, uh, by definition, is a, uh, those are organizations and agreements of the lowest common denominator, what you can get everybody to agree to, and oftentimes uh, those obligations aren't as strong as we would like. They form a baseline, which is important, uh, below which countries aren't allowed to fall, but it's insufficient, and that's why there has been effort, whether it's through bilateral or regional or plurilateral agreements, to use those kinds of agreements to raise standards. That was certainly the goal of, of TPP, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, to use the fact that you would have a group of countries developed, developing, large, small, critical mass, 40% of the global economy, who could collectively agree on a set of rules that go beyond the WTO, on state-owned enterprises, um, labor, environment, um, intellectual property rights, the digital economy, very importantly, and begin to create momentum towards raising the standard of multilateral uh, level as well. You know, you can only, the enforcement tools are only as good as the underlying obligations that they seek to enforce. And if those obligations are not terribly well defined, they're ambiguous, or they're uh, a relatively modest standard, um, there's going to be frustration. And that's why agreements like TPP uh, uh, were and are so important, because they seek to raise that standard and, by the way, strengthen the enforcement mechanisms as well. All right. Well, we're going to come back to you raise a lot of good points there, both about the WTO and about the sort of the, the, the country whose name we dare not speak of China. Um, but before that, I want to bore down a little bit more on point A. And as, as Matt had warned, um, we're going to get into some of the nitty gritty and some random sounding numbers, um, which is the existing toolkit. Um, so there are a number of tools that are on the books right now that you and your administration did not use. And indeed, uh, several administrations in a row have not used that the Trump administration is using, or at least looking at using, in particular, three. There is from the 1962 Trade Act, Section 232, which gives the president broad discretion to block imports on national security grounds, and two from the 1974 trade law, uh, Section 201, which allows for protection from import surges where the U.S. industry does not have to prove that foreign competitors violated rules, and Section 301, which allows a president to counter an act that his U.S. trade representative concludes violates an international trade agreement or is, quote, unjustified, unreasonable, or discriminatory, and that burdens or restricts U.S. commerce, unquote. So you didn't use 232, 201, or 301. Um, why not? And is their use now appropriate, or do you think that that creates some of the problems that you had alluded to of viability? So, so 201, the, the mechanism that deals with surges of imports, is a, uh, you apply it, or you're supposed to apply it, globally. It's not supposed to be directed at any one country. We instead used a, the equivalent of 201 vis-a-vis -vis China right. that was in the China Accession Agreement. We used it on tires. And I think we're the only, the only administration uh, uh, to do so. Although that, I think it expired at the end of your administration. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, uh, that's right. That's right. So the, the previous administration did not use it. We did use it. Um, uh, and I think that was appropriate. I think that was appropriate. I think you have to look to see, has there actually been an import surge from the global economy and what product is it that uh, is of uh, concern to see whether it is uh, uh, to see whether it is justified. Um, on on two thirty two, I think the same kind of rigorous analysis needs to be done. I mean, the idea is: it, are the imports of a product or the lack of domestic production of a product such that uh, it poses a national security threat to the United States? When you look at a product like steel. Uh, the top five steel source, sources of steel imports to the United States, um, I believe, are uh, Korea, Mexico, Turkey, Canada, and Germany, is it? Or perhaps. Anyway, four, uh, three out of the five are actually military allies of the United States. So it's a little bit tricky to argue that the import of steel from one of our NATO allies or another alliance ally is a 
national security threat uh, to us, given how integrated our economies are. But that's the kind of analysis that the administration is currently going through vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, steel uh, and aluminum, and we'll see what the judgment is and, and whether that's challenged and how they, how, they, uh, how they target it. 301 is in some ways the most interesting because um, I always viewed 301 as, um, as a delaying tactic. Hmm. If at the end of the day, you are going to find a country, if you, if you believe a country has violated its international obligations, then take it to the WTO. That's what we did, right? We just started cases. You didn't take a six month investigation in order to determine whether you should take it to the WTO. We, we spent the time actually doing the research and putting the, the cases together. And the reason why that's important and, and why this will be such an interesting case to see how it pans out is, what do you do at the end of a 301 investigation? Um, uh, the, the one perspective is, post WTO, post Uruguay round, is um, you take cases to the WTO. You no longer have the ability just to impose higher tariffs without going to the WTO and risking the uh, retaliation by other countries um, uh, and challenge by other countries. And so when this 301 investigation. Just, China, just 301, sorry, the China 301 IPR. On, on intellectual property and forced tech transfer. Exactly. When this reaches conclusion, whenever, whenever that is, the question will be what does the administration do? They can take a, a case to the WTO, in which case it's not really anything different than any other previous administration has done. They could impose tariffs, um, and that, there is a sense that that is what they are seeking to do. And then the question will be, if they impose tariffs without having gone to the WTO first, does China retaliate? And do we find ourselves in that tit for tat? I think trade war is a word, that's, is, a, is a phrase that's perhaps used too glibly, but- Like uh, reckless journalists to see that. <laughs> yes, exactly. But, but does it begin that process of, of, of um, action, reaction, retaliation, raising costs, disrupting supply chains, hurting consumers and the like, and of course, putting ourselves in violation of our WTO obligations, or potentially in our violation of our WTO obligations, giving other countries both the excuse to retaliate against us and even more concerning to imitate us. Because if the US loses the moral high ground of saying, and we're not always perfect, but if we generally are pretty good about upholding our WTO obligations, and that gives us the ability to go to other countries like China and put pressure on them to uphold their WTO obligations. If we begin to apply our WTO obligations selectively and say, well, in this case, we're just going to ignore them and impose tariffs on Chinese exports, well, other countries will say, oh, I guess selective, selective obligations are, are the new fashion. And uh, we, too, can begin to decide which WTO obligations we want to uh, ignore. And that, of course, has a much, uh, a much could have a, a very significant negative impact on U.S. companies, U.S. workers, uh, U.S. farmers and ranchers and the like. Um, it's one reason why I wonder at the end of the day, after 301 is over, whether instead of imposing tariffs, there may be a temptation to do something more on the investment side, where the W-2 obligations are weaker, where there's more flexibility, and whether that's taking up some of the current ideas being debated in, on Capitol Hill about expanding CPIUS to um, also encapsulate um, uh, joint ventures abroad, uh, or whether it means actually imposing some sort of uh, inward screening mechanism that goes beyond national security, as some other countries have. Canada, France, Australia, they all have mechanisms for screening foreign investment for national interest purposes or economic interest purposes. And um, that would perhaps be an action that invites less retaliation uh, because it's not as clear that it's in violation of our WTO obligations. So since you invoked the WTO a lot, let's talk a little bit about the World Trade Organization, which as Matt had alluded to is a topical topic this week. Uh, we are all stuck here in Washington where the forecast today is a high of 36. Uh, the WTO meetings in Buenos Aires, I checked the forecast. It's uh, a high there of 88 today, low of 67. Uh, it said though there'll be thunderstorm in spots. I'm not sure if that was meteorological or metaphorical. Um, but anyway, President Trump and, and his trade representative, Robert Lighthizer, your successor, uh, have both been quite critical of the WTO in general and in particular regarding its trade enforcement arm, the dispute settlement panels and the appellate body. In fact, they are 
currently blocking appointments of any new judges to the appellate body, which now has uh, vacancies for three of its seven seats. Now, Mike, you yourself had some frustrations with the WTO in general and also with the appellate body in particular, and you yourself took a step that at the time was seen as quite controversial, though maybe it's, it seems kind of gently quaint now, of, uh, of blocking one particular judge, a Korean judge, because you felt he wasn't doing his job appropriately. So, so the question I have is to what extent is the Trump Lighthizer agenda a continuation of the Obama Froman agenda with the WTO? Uh, and to what extent is it different? Well, first, I, I think it, it, it's clear that uh, uh, the WTO, like any organization, is imperfect. And there certainly are areas where it could be reformed and improved. And um, I think the Trump Lighthizer approach is both a continuation and a uh, and, and different from what um, uh, we did in the Obama administration. Um, I think we have seen that the appellate body at times has gone beyond its mandate. Uh, and when I say the appellate body, it's usually individual uh, um, members of the appellate body have gone beyond their mandate to decide cases in ways of them filling in gaps or um, uh, creating interpretations beyond what the agreement was among the member states. And that is, in our view, um, inappropriate, and that's why we did block the reappointment of one Korean member and supported the appointment of another Korean member who we felt shared the, the judicial philosophy of the appellate body uh, that the United States and many of the other member states um, agreed, agreed with. So I think that is very much uh, uh, appropriate. But I think the frustration with the dispute settlement body at the moment, in, in my view, is that uh, one, there are a lot more disputes. They're taking more time to get resolved. I think the answer to that is you want to have a fully staffed appellate body and a fully supported with all the resources necessary dispute settlement uh, mechanism so that you're not creating unnecessary, um, unnecessary bottlenecks. I think uh, uh, from what Ambassador Lighthizer has said in some of his uh, previous writings, um, there's a bit of a nostalgia for going back to the period in which there wasn't binding uh, an enforceable dispute settlement, where instead it was uh, countries uh, getting together and talking about the issues that divide them, um, as opposed to, to litigating them. And it was the U.S. What, it was one of the main movers in the Uruguay Round that sought to create binding dispute settlement, precisely because we didn't want other countries to act unilaterally, and we were frustrated with um, dispute getting talked about incessantly, but never actually reaching resolution. Um, and it's been interesting in, in regional agreements like TPP where we've tried to tighten up the dispute settlement process by making it even clearer that how quickly things have to get decided and move on to the next level <coughs> and preventing countries from blocking progress, uh, precisely learning the lessons of the WTO over the last, uh, over the last 20, um, uh, tw 20 years. So I think one can draw different lessons from history. Our lesson is that the disputes are, the lesson we drew in the Obama administration was um, the WTO does play a very useful role in its um, uh, provision of binding and enforceable dispute settlement. And to the degree that there are frustrations with that, one, you gotta make sure the appellate body members are doing their job correctly. And that's not an issue of us winning or losing particular cases. I mean, there, some of the cases we were concerned about had nothing to do with us. Uh, it was still the appellate body acting in ways that went beyond their mandate in our view. Make sure they have the resources and make sure that these cases get decided expeditiously. Um, I think the alternative view is, well, you know, perhaps the litigation, perhaps there's been too much litigation, countries are too litigious, and instead we should go back to uh, just sitting down and talking with other countries about it. We've had a long, a long experience with that prior to the creation of the WTO, and that wasn't terribly satisfactory either. So I don't think you wanna throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think you want to find ways of, of reforming and strengthening the existing system. So, so talk a little bit about the current standoff on the appellate body. What are the implications of that? I mean, what happens if the appellate body goes down to, well, it's four out of seven now, three uh, next year? Um, I'll, I'll defer, you have more, you have greater technical experts on your subsequent panel, so I'll, I, I, I will defer uh, to, to them. But I think one of the problems of not having uh, the, the dispute settlement mechanism fully staffed up is that you find the pipeline getting more and more clogged. And since that is one of the frustrations we have with the WTO, that it can take 18 months or two years to get through the whole process with all of the appeals, um, I would think that we'd want to make sure that it was staffed with good people, with people who 
shared uh, a common perspective on the role, the appropriate role of the appellate body, but to get it going sooner than later. So Ambassador Lighthizer, in his speech Monday morning to the plenary, gave a very interesting speech, um, which if folks are interested in this and haven't read it, I, I would encourage them to do so. And he laid out an agenda that seemed in a lot of ways, you know, to, to sort of put the U.S. on a very different focus on the WTO. Another issue that he mentioned had to do with the distinction between developed and developing countries, and essentially to make the argument that the WTO system has essentially broken down because a very large number of countries can self-designate as developing and therefore uh, exempt or, or getting exceptions to various rules. How serious a problem do you think that is for the functioning of the WTO? Well, I, I think it is a, a serious problem. And one reason I think the Doha round became deadlocked and why we spent um, several years during the Obama administration slowly turning the ship of the WTO out of what we viewed as kind of the cul-de-sac of the, of the Doha round um, was because it was premised on this idea that uh, certain countries being designated as developing had much weaker obligations than the developed countries. And you, know, you take a country like China, there are certainly um, many poor people in China. But it is hard to say that given its degree of competitiveness as a global trading partner, that China should be treated as though it doesn't have uh, the same kind of obligations that, uh, that, that uh, the United States or the EU has. It's the, you know, by some measure, the number one trading country in the world. It certainly has, its policies have had a very uh, significant impact on global trade. Um, and it's, those policies should be subject to the same kind of disciplines as uh, other major trading partners, uh, including the United States uh, and the European Union and Japan. So I, I think that, uh, that's just one example. And I think that's a substantive example. Frankly, it's also a political example. The idea that we could come back with an agreement where the United States took on a series of obligations and China took on none or few is just nonsensical. And so um, it, it's that kind of distinction that I think uh, needs to be brought down. By the way, you know, this, is an, this is a major area of focus during our administration of, of, of recognizing the role of major emerging economies like China uh, in the global system and you know, beginning to, to get rid of this distinction between um, uh, one group of countries and the other. The G20 was a reflection of that making sure that the major economies um, had a significant role at the table of global governance. If you look what happened on climate change, going back to, to Kyoto again, where you know, two lists of countries and developing countries uh, having no obligations um, and developed countries, only the only ones having obligations to Paris, started in Copenhagen and went to Paris, where the recognition was we're not gonna solve climate change unless the major emitting countries, regardless of where they are on the list, like uh, China and India, also have obligations and also uh, play a role. And the same is exactly true in the global trading system. We're not gonna have a coherent, rules-based, strong, and supported trading system if the major emerging economies uh, don't also play by the same set of rules. So China is, of course, the, the 1.3 billion person elephant in the room. So let's focus a little bit more on, on that. To what extent do you think that, I mean, if you were having this discussion about problems with trade enforcement, to what extent do you think that it is uh, sort of China and ex-China, as in how well do you think the system works if you could somehow have a system without China in it, and how much of the problem really is that the rules and tools don't seem to work as well with China as with everybody else? So I guess I, I, would, make, uh, I would make a distinction. I think the dispute settlement process is important for China, but it's also important for um, a lot of other countries. And um, uh, you know, a lot of developing countries, emerging economies around the world, uh, they take their WTO obligations, or they take the, w the multilateral system quite seriously. And when the multilateral system says they are in violation of a rule, it means a lot more than if just one country has said that, even a big country. And so, I think the system itself is important for um, countries beyond China. I think that the challenge is, is that, uh, that the, the, the WTO rules um, have not been as useful in dealing with the kind of uh, dynamic that China has to the global economy, giving it the state capitalist system. And the Uruguay Round Agreement uh, 
um, uh, as good as it was would prove, has proven not to be sufficient to deal with the kind of subsidies and the state-owned enterprise distortions and the role of the state banks and things of that sort that, uh, that China poses, excess capacity, its rather predatory industrial policy, those sorts of challenges. That's why we have, we and others have needed to build other mechanisms um, like the TPP or what the European Union has done around the world or uh, what the Pacific Alliance has done to try and use regional mechanisms to raise standards uh, to deal with some of these issues um, uh, because the WTO has proven insufficient in that regard. Um, uh, but that's something I think is going to be continue to be a work in progress. And, and obviously, you know, um, it's no secret that I think the U.S. withdrawal from TPP will be seen in retrospect as one of the greatest strategic and economic blunders um, in, recent, in recent history, um, in part because that was an effort to deal with many of the challenges that the Trump administration has identified in the global trading system, including the role of China. Okay. Um, I think we're uh, going to open it up to the audience now. Uh, please wait for a microphone, raise your hand, identify yourself. Uh, there's a question here in the second row. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Maria Luisa Boyce. I'm with UPS. Thank you so much for the comment, uh, Ambassador. I have uh, two, two questions in one. One is, um, the, if you can share a little bit how was the challenge for you as you were forward facing working on the international trade agenda and the messages, how, what were the challenges that you saw domestically internally selling that same trade message? Because I think we saw as a general from both um, parties, there was this negative connotation about trade either way. I don't know if we would have survived TPP one way or the other just because of the, the, the words and how trade was being described domestically. So would love to hear your thoughts on that. And then the second one is, as the WTO has been working and the TFA is in implementation, e-commerce is growing, right? And has become this big monster or big gorilla in the room. And it's changing the way supply chain works. It's changing now that anyone from their house can sell and they're not aware of compliance or rules, right? And so that brings another challenge. How do you see that a challenge becoming another factor in that conversation of, of the trade regulations around the Great. world? Sure. Thank you. So on, on the first one, I think um, uh, trade is, I'm sure these panels will show is a very arcane subject, uh, very detailed and technical in its, own, in its own way. And I think the challenge of that is, it's very easy to criticize trade on a bumper sticker and it takes two or three paragraphs to explain why the bumper sticker is wrong. And that kind of asymmetry in public education is a, is a, is a very big challenge. I will also say that, um, uh, you know, I, I think, well, I think the, the business community here and others who benefited from trade, whether it's environmental groups or others, um, we saw certainly in the run up to the 2016 election, they wanted to see every detail, final detail of an agreement and make sure they were fully satisfied with it before they would get out there and start doing positive things. The opponents of trade don't feel the need to see an agreement to know that they're opposed to it. And so they are out there for years, um, I think, uh, laying the foundation, and that's also very hard to dig out of. Um, and, and thirdly, I think it, we tend to sell trade, and this is our mistake, on the opportunity for expanding exports, for opening new markets, for raising standards. We tend to sell it with statistics, how it's gonna grow GDP or grow exports. Uh, and the opponents tend to um, sell their argument based on emotion, the, the fears, fears of, of losing your job, fears of, of seeing reduced wages. We need to be better at making the emotional argument for trade. You know, we can make iPhones in this country, completely in this country, uh, but they'll probably cost $3,000. And they won't be available to the single mother who uses it to FaceTime with her kids when she's running between her two jobs. And you know, people rely on trade in ways that they have no uh, realization of, whether it's how to clothe their family or send their kids back to school on a modest budget, um, uh, or uh, the products that they're working on or the services they're working on, how much those are tied into 
the global economy. We need to make that case on a much uh, a more um, foundational basis and personal, personal basis. Having said all that, I see uh, Bruce Stokes in the audience and you know, the Pew Foundation. If you look at their work, their polling work, the situation is not nearly as dire as one would think when you've got more than 70% of the American public supporting trade. You know, for the first time in, uh, since the surveys have been conducted, and Bruce will correct me, a majority of the, uh, of, of the American public not only thinking that trade is good from a consumer perspective, but that it creates jobs. You know, 71% of Democrats supporting NAFTA. You wouldn't know that from the floor of the Democratic National Convention, but uh, there's actually a lot more support for trade out there, I think, among the rank and file than, than, one, uh, than, than, than one believes. Um, on your set question of e-commerce, I think it's one of the most exciting areas of, uh, of cutting edge trade policy, the, the digital economy issues, what we call the digital two dozen, the, the, the 24 obligations that were in TPP that helped define an ecosystem that was promoting innovation, allowing small businesses, uh, individuals at times, you know, the Etsy person who's you know, making a craft in her living room and selling it to somebody in Australia and using telecom and software services and express delivery services and electronic payment services. Those are all things that, are, that a trade agreement makes possible. I, it certainly was, uh, I think, one of the digital economy chapter is one of the things I was most excited about in TPP and I see it's finding a way into other agreements. At the WTO, there's a lot of talk about focusing on e-commerce. I think there are very different ideas about what that means, um, so we'll have to see how that progresses, but I do think it's one of the more exciting areas for the future of the trading system. Another question here in the, actually, let's go to the gentleman in the front row here. Uh, and please keep the question tight. If you could, we're running a little short on time, but please go ahead, identify you, yourself. You won't mind if I stay sat. Please. My name is Michael Smith, and <clears throat> if you won't, if you'll pardon the indiscretion, I take some uh, umbrage at Mr. Trump's statements that the NAFTA and the WTO are the worst trade agreements ever negotiated. Since I negotiated them, I'm, some, I'm somewhat upset about that. But <clears throat> my, my question to you, sir, is the agenda for today was building a trade, a U.S. trade enforcement agency. When I was deputy trade representative, our biggest problem in enforcing an agreement was not the external forces, but was the internal forces in the United States government, and particularly State Department, and Treasury Department, uh, and a few others. And I can say this because I was a Foreign Service officer on detail to USTR. But I'm wondering how you would come to devise a U.S. trade enforcement agreement that would be enforced internally and quickly. Yeah, we, yeah. Oh, sorry, actually, back, I was going to say, why don't you pass the microphone back to the gentleman behind you, and we'll take two we'll questions, take two questions. In a row. I'm sorry, I can't hear that. Oh, uh, just say, what was, you had a question as well, sir? Yes. Yeah, I mean, why don't we combine these two? But it's, it's a very different That's all right. question. It's about, it's about China. Okay. Uh, uh, because I think it's fair to say that the, when the WTO was uh, negotiated, and Mike Smith was a great uh, actor in that. And please identify uh, yourself. It was uh, Jean-Francois Watin for his CP, uh, French uh, economic think tank. It was assumed that all countries would more or less follow the uh, capitalist model, right? And that was the whole case for China's negotiations. Uh, now China is a member. It's a model of different capitalism, state capitalism. What chances are there that the WTO structure or rules can be changed now that China is in? And if they can be changed, what type of future does it mean for the, for the organization? Why don't you take both of those? And sure. So uh, on, the, on, on the first one, um, I think that's actually changed since the time that you were in, in government because I found uh, that we never, never found ourselves having an internal disagreement over, <laughs> over, over this. I mean, the only time foreign policy, and by the way, I'll take China as an example. It was very important to, to in many respects, to separate the economic and the strategic relationship because we made clear to the Chinese that we were not gonna pull our punches on economics. If we found them in violation, we we're gonna bring cases, and you know, bringing cases against them became 
a, a matter of course. We had a process for informing them beforehand, 24 hours beforehand. It was all done, very, it did not lead to any major problem in the relationship. And we made clear we're gonna to continue to do that even as we seek to cooperate on North Korea or Iran, counterterrorism, other issues. And the relationship had matured, I think, to a point where that was possible. In fact, the only time that I found that, that foreign policy concerns entered into the, the enforcement agenda was only over timing. You know, if, if, if the Secretary of State was gonna be in Beijing, you know, we decided that, okay, we could wait 48 hours before bringing a case. We didn't need to do it while he was there, you know, or if a Chinese official was in the United States, even though we were ready to bring a case, we could wait a week before bringing it. That was the only, time, that was the only impact of, of that. And, and the, the State Department, the, uh, uh, the Treasury Department, all very strongly supportive of a robust, uh, of a robust trade enforcement uh, agenda. I think it's just a reflection of how things had, had, has evolved, and particularly the challenge of, uh, of the, the challenge. No, I, of I wonder if that's necessarily true in this administration, but. Yeah. Um, on the WTO and, and, and China, I think it's a very interesting question. When you have a, an organization that runs by consensus, um, you are going to be somewhat limited in making major changes that really go after the practices of one major uh, member state. I think all the more important that the WTO has opened the door now to plurilateral agreements, uh, regional agreements, other mechanisms where rules can be evolved and as critical mass gets created around these rules, the pressure becomes greater for the multilateral system also to take them up. Um, I think that ultimately is gonna be our, our, our way of, uh, of, of changing it. I'm told we have time for one more. Uh, I guess this woman here in the second row. Hello, um, Kate McNulty, I'm actually with the State Department, so I appreciate the comments um, related to our work. Uh, one question that I had is we're, we're talking about the U.S. trade enforcement agenda as though the United States government unilaterally kind of pushes this forward, um, identifying the priorities, but U.S. industry plays an incredibly important role, and historically, in fact, a lot of the tools that we're seeing used now have been a petitioner-driven process. Um, 301 and others. I'm curious if, you know, we're seeing that change obviously in other areas. I'm curious, you know, your thoughts on the advantages, the challenges that come with that kind of change. Thanks. Well, look, I think it, it is, uh, it's very hard to bring enforcement actions without the involvement and the support of industry. Oftentimes because that's where the data is that you need to build the case. So whether and that's true of WTO cases, and we worked hand in glove with, you know, with, the, with the aluminum industry, for example, when um, we built the case that we brought to the WTO on uh, how the state banking system and other inputs were, were providing um, subsidized capital and subsidized inputs into, the, into the, creating the excess capacity problem in aluminum. I hope that's a case that the administration uh, picks up again and takes forward. Um, I think even the, the notion of self-initiation is a little bit of a red herring because, as, as I recall, and, and Chuck or others were probably involved with this, you know, when the semiconductor case in 1980s or so was self-initiated, well, it was the industry that did all the work and then they handed the file to the government and the government filed it. So it's more symbolic than, than real. And that's, you still need that because the government doesn't have access to all of the sometimes proprietary information to be able to show injury and, and, and show the impact of, uh, of imports and, and dumping on, uh, on the US. So it's got to be hand in glove. Um, uh, and by the way, I think that applies to other issues too, environmental enforcement, labor enforcement. You, we need to be able to work with the stakeholders who often have on the ground um, uh, textured insights into the issue to help make the case. I think that's all we have time for, but Mike, thank you very much for sharing your insights and look forward to the next rounds of response, I guess. It's the, thank you. Thank you.
terrific conversation and uh, a lot of uh, um, questions have been initially answered, but there are also kind of opportunities to dig in a little bit more to some of those topics that uh, folks raised. So um, again, if you weren't here at the very beginning, I'm Matthew Goodman, I, uh, I'm the Simon Chair here in Political Economy at CSIS, and I have a terrific uh, panel of experts here. Let me just first introduce them and then I'm gonna say some framing remarks and then I'll start asking questions up here. Claire Reed, a uh, colleague here, she's senior associate associated with the Freeman Chair here at, uh, in China Studies here at CSIS, also a, um, uh, uh, a partner at um, senior counsel at Arnold Porter, um, law firm and was formerly uh, assistant USTR for China, Taiwan, Mongolia, and probably other places that yes. I can't remember, uh, but in the um, Obama administration. Uh, next to her is Chuck Levy, who is partner at Cassidy Levy Kent. Uh, I think if you don't know who Chuck is, then you're probably, uh, well, you should be here. That's good, because you're, <laughs> you're gonna learn a lot from Chuck. He is, a, um, I think, the word legend may be thrown around a little too much, but he is a real legend in, uh, in trade law here in Washington. So we're delighted to have Chuck with us as well. Um, and then my colleague, Scott Kennedy at the end, who is um, deputy director of the Freeman Chair in China, China Studies here at CSAS um, and directs a program on, which I always forget the name of, but Chinese business uh, and political economy. And political economy, I got it, okay. Um, so uh, terrific panel. Let me just say to frame here, I said that uh, this is a hot topic, trade enforcement, and it is, but it's also, it feels like back to the future. It feels like the 1980s in some way when you uh, hear, uh, again, Section 301, something that I had learned about in grad school in the 80s and then saw used uh, a lot uh, in uh, particularly vis-a-vis uh, -vis Japan in the 1980s when I was starting uh, in the Treasury Department in the late 80s. Um, and so it feels like we're back to the future. And so when I think about that time, I think about in, in terms of enforcement, um, I, I remember that um, this was an issue, again, because there were lots of cases being filed against Japan. Uh, interestingly, we never actually used 301 uh, at the end. I mean, we never actually used the final authorities to do bad things to Japan uh, uh, directly. We did take uh, sanctions. We imposed 100% tariffs on uh, uh, Japan for b alleged violations of a semiconductor agreement, but I believe that was not a 301 case. Um, so, but anyway, there was lots of this enforcement talk. But at the same time, I also recall that um, we did a really bad job of, of following up on all these agreements that we were negotiating. I remember the American Chamber of Commerce at one point asked USTR to provide all of the 35 or 40 agreements that had been reached with Japan over the last uh, decade and USTR literally did not have these in their files. It was pre-electronic files and they couldn't find all of these agreements on different topics. Remember that, Bruce? I, 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 it was a, a sort of shocking. So in a way, we were, we were all focused on, on negotiating cool new things, but we didn't actually then at least seem to have all the processes in place to, you know, to follow up or the incentives uh, to follow up and enforce. So that's one story. The other story is um, just something Mike said about making the emotional case from trade. One of the first things I did as a trade guy at Treasury in the 1980, late 1980s was participate in an interagency uh, hearing um, at the ITC, I think, um, on a case where we were gonna take an action against Brazil for violations of a pharmaceutical patent agreement. Um, and we had hearings from various interested parties. And I remember a young man from, I can't remember if it was North or South Carolina, but he ran a family business making and selling frames, you know, picture frames or door frames uh, out of wood. And um, uh, all of his inputs came from Brazil, the, the wood chips and the particle board or whatever he used in the frames. And these were on the retaliation list. They were gonna impose 100% tariffs on uh, his imported input. And this guy, uh, I mean, he was calm, but he said, you know, if you do this to me, I've got six employees. You know, my father founded this business. Uh, 30 years ago, I'm right, I will go out of business, I can't, you know. And it made a very powerful impact on me in terms of thinking about, you know, what we're doing uh, when, we, um, when we engage in, um, in, in serious issues like trade enforcement. So a little just personal background to say, I think there are ways of telling these stories uh, that, that, um, uh, that uh, are, are quite powerful. Um, so with that, enough um, for me. This panel is, we're gonna to try to divide the, the two panels into sort of diagnosis of the problems uh, and in the second panel to talk about solutions and sort of prognosis of where things are headed. 
Uh, but obviously, we're gonna, these things are going to kind of blur together. So I, uh, be patient with us. I think we've got such good expertise up here, they could address any aspect of this. Let me start down at the other end with Scott and ask about uh, the gorilla or elephant, I'm not sure which uh, species we, um, we've identified uh, in the room, uh, China. So China joined the WTO 16 years ago this month uh, and you know cut its industrial tariffs to below 9% as it promised. It did a lot of the other things that it committed to do. Um, and yet everybody's mad at China or worried about China. Uh, what is it that China isn't doing right or that has caused this, uh, this conversation about needing a different approach to enforcement, whether through domestic law or through the WTO? Sure. Um, thanks, Matt, for um, organizing the event. And um, thanks, everyone, for, for coming out uh, on such a cold morning. Um, and so I can say a little bit about the, the, the China uh, problem. Uh, I, I've written too many things with the word dragon, so I don't want to focus on that species as an alternative. Um, now, China doesn't have a planned economy, uh, certainly very different than uh, 30 or 40 years ago, uh, but there is, um, and, and of course, um, most prices in China, the vast majority of them are set by the market. 99% of companies in China are actually private companies. Um, and 77, 70 percent of the economy is in private hands, uh, and as you mentioned, Chinese tariffs are, have dropped considerably um, to under 10 percent uh, on a weighted average under 5 percent. Um, China's largest recipient of foreign direct investment, uh, unlike Japan, which has always uh, uh, created much more limits to, to direct investment. So we don't want to give the impression that the China problem is one that it, it, it's had a planned economy and it's just kept that in force. So I think we need a, a little bit of perspective. That, um, that said, China is far from a free market. Um, I think people like to use the term market intervention, uh, but I like to use the word market shaping because the, the policies that the Chinese have are about shaping uh, how the markets operate. So what is actually uh, being produced which firms can produce them, uh, what uh, are the standards of those products, um, quality standards, technical standards, uh, who can get access to credit both as a seller, uh, as a producer, and as a buyer, uh, what prices are they allowed to sell them at, um, and uh, how one disposes of their profits. All of these things, uh, the Chinese have detailed uh, rules and regulations and even oral guidance, uh, things that you can't see uh, written down. In fact, transparency of Chinese industrial policies is as big a problem as the actual substances of, of the policies themselves. Um, there's a question, there's a good question would be, you know, which of these things are the worst, biggest problems uh, for us? And, you know, if you had to choose, I think you'd say the market access problems and the financing uh, stand out as the biggest problems. Uh, because they tilt the playing field so much, but actually it's the, the whole uh, group of things together that create the biggest challenge. And, and, for, and when we talk about enforcement, usually you're enforcing on a specific discrete policy, but in fact it's the, the integration of these different actions together that create the, the challenge uh, or, or, or the biggest problem. Um, these things have huge consequences for um, not only China, but for everyone uh, who trades with China. And this is, a, I think, the reason that we talk about China so much, not only because the integration, coherence of the policies, but how large China's economy is and now that it's 15% you know, of global GDP uh, and the world's largest trading country. So um, that means that what China does affects not only market competition in China, but in third markets, uh, and it affects um, the efficiency of these markets and then how much money is available for innovation. Um, if you wanted, I could talk ab about a whole bunch of sectors where this uh, matters. I'll just mention one sector uh, right now, uh, new electric vehicles. It's in the papers every single day. Uh, China has a 30 million car market. It's the, by far the largest car market in the world. Uh, they plan by uh, two years from now for, for electric cars to be 10% of that. Um, and on, on Monday, the, the 16th anniversary of China's entry to the WTO, they issued a new regulation uh, requiring that, local, that the central and local governments around the country 
uh, by domestically made electric vehicles. Right? Uh, it's hard to find out how many cars uh, uh, local and central government in China have, but it's somewhere about 10% of the market. So that's three million uh, vehicles uh, that will be required to be purchased uh, by domestic producers. Uh, that has a big effect. Uh, uh, the global market for electric vehicles right now uh, is somewhere under short of a million. So you're talking about the largest market for electric cars uh, and uh, the biggest area of, of growth. And if that's blocked from foreign uh, buyer, foreign producers of electric vehicles who make the most advanced electric vehicles, that's going to have a, a big distortionary effect uh, on that sector. So. Uh, and that's just one. You could co talk about dozens of sectors where that's a challenge. Yeah, I want to come back and ask you about sectors in a, in a moment. But let me bring Claire in here and sort of to bridge uh, to uh, the issues of domestic um, U.S. trade law. And so add any other thoughts you want about why China is the problem and what the problem is. But also, you know, what are the, what are the, what's the challenge for the United States in terms of our own trade laws and our ability to deal with the, whatever the problem is as you define it, Claire? Thanks, Matt. I think we also will hear from Chuck on, mm -hmm. on that subject. So uh, I don't, I don't want to be uh, repetitious here. But um, if we start with the notion, and we're focused on China for the moment, that um, there are major market distorting practices in China, they, they basically uh, create problems both in terms of a very large internal market in China that other countries would like to be able to have access to that is cut off or protected, as well as then the projection um, of, uh, well, the development of Chinese national champions in the protected market, and then the projection out. And so the effect on the United States is not just direct import-export, but also activities in third country markets, in addition to the, the, the implications for us in, in not having access to the Chinese market. Um, you know, the question is, is the U.S. Remedies Toolkit inadequate? I'm sure Chuck is going to talk about that in a lot of detail. Um, and then the next question is, if we look at the WTO dispute settlement system, you know, is it broken? And some of the rhetoric in both of these spaces is relatively hot right now. Um, I guess what I would like to note is that um, there is definite utility to each of the tools in the toolbox. The question is, where are there gaps? And then, you know, let's identify those gaps. Um, so uh, anti-dumping and countervailing duty cases are very good. If you have a product-specific problem, you've got a product-specific subsidy, you have product-specific pricing, and you have direct U.S. imports, and you already have injury, or the injury is imminent. Okay, that's a very specific set of problems, and that gets you, you're pretty far down the chain of trouble by the time you use your dumping or your countervailing duty. Um, and it's very sort of rifle shot because it's very focused. Uh, Section 201, that's when there is um, a massive surge of imports and it's causing serious injury. So now we again have to have injury, it has to be extreme, and you then are allowed to take temporary measures. And then you've got the Section 301, which is a very open-ended um, statute. And I know Chuck will probably talk about some other open-ended statutes that aren't as well known, potentially. Um, but the issue there is an issue that Mike Froman raised, which is, at the end of the day, if you find practices that you don't like, what are you going to do about them? And are there constraints on the United States in terms of the international rules that we have signed on to that are going to make it uh, are going to make less room for maneuvering in terms of what we do. So if we find China has shut off its market to us in some way that's dreadfully unfair, but in the WTO we agreed our market was going to be open in those same areas, uh, it's, we would violate the WTO if we just did you know, a, a reciprocal closing. So what do we do? Do we just say the hell with the WTO? And then we have those cascading impacts with regard to do we want to live in a world where it really is now a power-based world again as opposed to a rules-based world? What kind of predictability do we lose? What kind of stability do we lose? So do we really want to cross that line? And that to me is a very, very important question. 
So let's look for a minute at the WTO dispute settlement system, and I'm going to look at it through the lens of China because that's where I was intensively involved. It has weaknesses. It's definitely not a panacea. But for someone to say that it doesn't work at all, and it doesn't work at all with China because of China's challenges, I think is an oversimplification. It has worked with China. So what works? First of all, uh, the WTO system allows you to attack certain kinds of subsidies very effectively and not to have to go product by product, to be able to attack them across the entire economy. And if, they're, uh, if it's a subsidy, for example, that promotes exports from China, that's a subsidy, or any country, that's a subsidy that can be attacked quite efficiently through the WTO, and the United States has done that. Um, that happened uh, also local content. If you have a situation where you say uh, there's now a law and inside our country you must only buy um, electric vehicles, if you're not a government, leave the government out for a minute, you must only buy electric vehicles that um, are made with local content, that's a prohibited subsidy. So you can attack that across the board and that's happened and China has been attacked, and China has complied with the WTO findings. You can also attack systemic policies that deal with issues like resource hoarding, so uh, natural resources. China was a dominant supplier of a whole set of natural resources and set up export prohibitions and restrictions so that the, that the result was it created global prices that were higher for everybody else, and low prices inside the Chinese market that Chinese industry could take advantage of. US and others went to the WTO, fought those practices, won, and China dismantled those barriers. And the final one I'll give you is a more uh, idiosyncratic one, but sometimes there are power players in China who really overreach. And assuming that the Chinese leadership does not support them, when they overreach and it becomes visible, you can take them, you can claw that back, you can push that back. So there was a WTO case that was brought when Xinhua, a very powerful Chinese Communist Party media organ, organization, got uh, ambitious and decided that it really wanted to take over some important financial information um, industries that were really had at the pinnacle of their capacity, they were Western companies. And uh, they were taken to the WTO, and that was exposed, and Xinhua had to back off, and they stopped. So it can work. It's not that it never can work. OK, but when does it create problems? Easy answer, where the WTO doesn't have any rules like competition law, where the WTO rules aren't strong enough, like intellectual property enforcement, where the rules may require too much evidence, or it's too hard, it's too costly. So for example, there are rules that would allow a country to stop another country from dumping in third markets. But it's very, very complicated to put together the evidence and to make the showing that would allow that case to be successful. It's very, very complicated. Also, um, as uh, others have noted, areas where the evidence is hard to get. What if it's an informal practice? What if it's an oral request? What if it's, it's hard to document that and take that then to some kind of dispute settlement? That's tech transfer. That's a state-owned enterprise, not purchasing or not selling in appropriate situations. And then finally, you know, there are these systemic issues. You know, do you have the WTO taking too long to solve a problem? Do you have the rules being interpreted in a way which is, exceeds really what the WTO was supposed to be about? It's both diplomatic and has a sort of a, a judicial quality to it, but it's a mix. And so if you start having judges make decisions where they, they say, I'm basing this on a precedent and this is how we have to rule. I don't think that's where the WTO members came in when they set up this very delicate balance and pushing the balance too hard towards hard rules in a kind of world court-like model is not what people bought onto. And I think you have to be very careful about that.
Okay, great. Well, boy, lots to follow up on there. But let me bring Chuck in, um, and, and actually in a way that I wasn't originally intending, but we were having a conversation in the back before um, about the past. Uh, you were talking about um, that some of the seeds of these problems today go back to uh, the, the Uruguay round and, and what happened there and what didn't happen. And I, can you go back and review yeah. that for the audience? Because yeah. I thought it was very interesting. Yeah. That, that question relates to what Scott and, and Claire just said because they sort of have joined their issues at the, at the hip of Scott talking about some of the uniqueness of, of the, the Chinese economy and the fact that it isn't uh, uh, much of, the, the, it, it doesn't reflect what we thought would evolve as a Western style uh, market economy. And Claire's talked about how the WTO dispute settlement and WTO agreements were actually quite good in the Uruguay round in dealing with what we all perceived as, as essentially issues that could be addressed in the context of Western uh, market-oriented economies. And there are, as I think, and I agree with Claire, you can stretch and apply some of these to China. I think that's right. But I thought uh, what the, the most, uh, what I really want to associate myself with that Claire said is there are big gaps, and I think that, uh, uh, and this goes to, we had these gaps in the 1980s. Uh, I think today we sort of take for granted that we have a GATS agreement on services, that we have a TRIPS agreement, but in the 1980s, Tri TRIPS is intellectual property. intellectual property. In the 1980s, this was a furious debate where the U.S. industry had a great deal of, of um, uh, uh, had to take, uh, undertake a great deal of effort to convince the U.S. government to undertake trips and GATS negotiations, and I think the U.S. government did, and Mike Smith was an awesome negotiator and, and really set a lot of that progress in the right direction. Uh, 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 and, and what you need to look at is go back and look at the history, for example, of Section 301. It was really designed initially to put tension in the system, that if the system, being the GATT, was not going to address trips and services, that the U.S. was going to address it. And we would address it by throwing an elbow around every so often. And it was designed not for protectionist purposes, but to get people's attention that wouldn't it be better if we negotiated this in the GATT instead of bilaterally? And, and if you go back and look at the history of 301, uh, and it, it began to change uh, uh, in 1984 to deal with this issue of how does the United States convince other countries to fill gaps? Because other countries were not that interested in filling gaps. And what's interesting, if you go back and look at it, uh, and, I, and I think John Verano was one of the first people to point this out, and I thought it was great, that the roots of Section 301 goes all the way back to the Reciprocal Trade Act of 1934. The same s sort of concepts, unfair, unreasonable, burdensome, discriminatory, were, 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 were found in uh, the, the legislation related to the Trade Act, uh, the Reciprocal Trade Act of 34. And then what's interesting, it also reappeared in the Trade Expansion Act. These were not put in there for protectionist purposes. These were put in there in a recognition that as we move forward in negotiating new types of trade agreements, gaps would appear and that we had to, as Claire said, the systems we were developing wouldn't, after every negotiation, cover everything. So how could we add tension to the system to convince people to, to move forward? And in the 80s, uh, the EU was jag, drag kicking and screaming into the TRIPS negotiations and the GATS negotiations. Oh yeah, I sat at the, I sat at the table uh, uh, well, I, let, me, let me put it this way. I see we'll uh, my, rebuttal, European, rebuttal my European later. colleague is shaking his head. I sat at the table in, in Brussels in, in the early 80s and, and in and London screamed at by both European industry and European negotiators that the GATT was not the place to negotiate services and not the place to negotiate uh, uh, um, uh, trips. And Mike is shaking his head. They ultimately came along, but part of this process was, if you look at the evolution of 301, it began to be amended by Congress to specifically say, 
There's an intellectual property problem. There's a services problem. And if the GATT isn't going to deal with it, we'll deal with it bilaterally. And I think that what's most interesting, in 1984, uh, there was an effort by uh, members of Congress that I would classify, I won't name names because uh, many of them are friends of ours and their staffs who are still around are friends of ours, that wanted to put into Section 301 a strict reciprocity provision based on trade deficits that would trigger retaliation if the trade deficit no, got out of control. Don't give people ideas. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, but the point is it was rejected by the Congress. It was rejected by the Congress. And then in, in, 80, in, in 1988, there was an effort to, to sort of, again, uh, trigger sort of a trade deficit related issue, and it was rejected. But what happened in 1988, and I want to tie into what Mike Froman was talking about. In 1988, the Congress, I think, and I think the private sector, which helped draft the 88 301 provisions. Uh, you know, so uh, people should stop calling Section 301 protectionist. It gets me very mad. It was never designed to be protectionist. Because um, uh, a lot of time was spent in designing the architecture and the rules uh, and, and the procedures. And, uh, and it goes to what Mike Froman said. In the Congress and the private sector working together decided to split 301 in 1988. And they split it into A and B. And A was, if you've got a violation in the, WT, in, in the GATT, let's go to the GATT. You know, we're not going to do this unilaterally. Let's go to the GATT and prosecute the case in the GATT. And that's, I think, what, what Mike was talking about. But they also recognized, as the Congress did with the Reciprocal Trade Act, the Trade Expansion Act, the 84 Act, that they're still in the negotiations and agreements. There would be gaps not covered. The GATT wouldn't cover. Uh, the, the uh, certain areas. And they put Section 301B in, which basically said, in those areas not covered by the GATT, we need to have tools in which to get the attention of other countries with a degree of threat. There's nothing wrong with threat. I mean, we threaten our children. Uh, we threaten our spouses. And we get threatened in return. To, to get attention, to, so they can get our attention, so they listen to it, get, the, the attention is, is set up. And it was set up for that purpose. And interestingly enough, I, I personally believe, and there may be people in the audience who disagree with me, the dynamic of Section 301 did play a role, it wasn't the only role, in getting the Uruguay round moving in the direction, I see Mike shaking his head because he was there. And, it, it, it helped create a dynamic, the tension saying, let's see what we could do about GATs. Let's see what we could do about trims. Let's see what we could do about trips. It was that tension. They didn't want, the countries didn't want us going off and trying to be the judge and jury. And so we had uh, the, the Uruguay round negotiation. And I think where we are today, as, um, as, as Claire said, uh, I think those of us that, and a lot of people in this room, we all have share in, 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 in playing a role uh, of the success of the Uruguay round. And I think we were, we were rather pleased with it. We got trips, we got gas, we got trims, we got a dispute settlement system. And I think what happened is we spent too much time high-fiving and slapping ourselves on the back. And we weren't watching what was happening, particularly as China uh, began to knock on the, the WTO's door. And uh, we thought that we had set up a system with the WTO and the successes we had in the Uruguay round that the WTO was going to be dynamic. It was going to be dynamic in the ability to repeat the successes of the Uruguay round in negotiating new agreements as issues develop, like forced technology transfers, need for stronger IP. The agreements would be modernized and that we would have this binding dispute settlement system that would reinforce the agreements that existed and the new agreements, and it's collapsed. The WTO has collapsed as a negotiating entity right now, uh, and, uh, and it's got problems in the DSU 
which can be dealt with, and I think it's, it's incumbent upon the United States, it, raising the issues as we've always done, is not to just sit there and, 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 and raise problems, but also we need to raise solutions. Uh, if their WTO dispute settlement has problems, well, what, let's get a, a list of solutions that we, issues we need to deal with. But we have a problem in that we've set up a dispute settlement that was designed to deal with the problems anticipating new agreements. We don't have those new agreements, unlikely to get the new agreements. And we're confronted now is what does the United States do? It's a, sort of a repeat to me of 1988. Uh, of, of, the, of the 1980s, there are issues out there, like forced technology transfers and how do you deal with state-owned enterprises and gaps in, in trips that ne should be negotiated in the WTO, but there's no dynamic there. So we are forced back into looking what our tools are. And we agreed, and I think we agreed in good faith and the right aspiration to uh, putting 301 under a degree of discipline in in the um, uh, DSU uh, uh, that came out of the Uruguay round. But uh, um, I think that the Congress, at least in 1980, was prescient. I don't, I'm not sure they could do that today, um, but uh, be that prescient today. But uh, um, uh, they did in 301 in 1988 and set out the remedies that were contemplated under 301 with some degree of specificity. And those remedies actually are disciplined by the WTO rules. And I think, as Claire said, we have to be careful about violating the WTO. But they did include a clause in Section 301 that referred to taking action not only as specified in the statute, but any action within the authority of the president. President has lots of, President of the United States has lots of authority under lots of different statutes. And given the situation we're in, it's going to take a degree of, um, I don't know what Bob Lighthizer is going to do, uh, but I think, again, w, 301 operates at two levels, an investigation and then a remedy. And there's lots of discretion never to get to the remedy phase. That was the design to encourage negotiations. And I hope that this report that will come out on intellectual property will be sufficient to encourage negotiations. If not, then, then, uh, then the remedy phase will have to be looked at. But I think people, uh, I, I, I think that given the fact that the statute says within the power of the president, there may be remedies there that can be crafted that are not necessarily violations of our WTO obligations. And therefore, as Claire said, do not put us in a situation of undermining the WTO. I think a lot of thought's going to be given to that. Um, um, you know, and maybe we could have like a Game of Thrones type TV series or something about it. But I, I, I think there's a lot of power that the president has. Yeah. And I think that's going to be the issue coming forward. But I want to add one other thing, another dimension that we never had, at least I don't remember seeing. In all of our confrontations with Japan in the 1980s and with other countries, um, U.S. companies who did rely on trade remedies relied on trade remedies. I think today we have something else eating at the international system. And that is China threatens companies that try to rely on international recognized trade remedies. That is not healthy for the WTO system. Those remedies were agreed to in the WTO. This, I'm talking about dumping countervail. As a practitioner, I can assure you that, that as companies think about filing cases, and I, I, our firm, when I was at Wilmer, uh, before I retired from Wilmer, and our new firm, Cassidy Levy Kent, we represented, we represent both. We're one of the few firms that I think other firms do, but we're one of the few firms that have always worked both sides of the aisle. We, we represent both respondents and petitioners. 
But on the petitioner side, most of the companies that we represent who have brought, who are considering petitions against China, are they get called in by the Chinese, and there's a lot of hand wringing about whether to bring cases or not. And we've had a number of cases that we did not bring because they were threatened by China. This is not the way that the, the global multilateral system can work. You can, shouldn't be doing that. Can I, I mean, there's just so much here, it's gonna be impossible to follow up on all the things I wanna follow up on, but let me just pick up on that point and ask Scott, and, and then maybe Claire as well. Do, do you think the Chinese, um, you know, Scott, Chuck suggested that there may be ways that we can do things under domestic law that, that and the president does have a lot of authority. We haven't even mentioned another law that he has at his disposal, the International Economic Emergency Powers Act, or IEPA, which allows him to basically do whatever the hell he wants um, if he's in a bad mood on a given day, which is a scary thought. But and he, and he, declares a severe he, national emergency. Right, okay, but that's relatively easy, right? So, so there, are, there are powers. It's not, it doesn't feel like there's an actual you know, you know, gap in our statutory authorities if we want to use them creatively based on what you just said, Chuck, and what I just said. But, um, but, if we, but if we act in a way that, and let's say we can find a solution that is, um, gets China's attention but doesn't violate the WTO, is China going to see that as, um, you know, okay, because, you know, at least you're not violating the WTO and we'll take it for what it is, or do they, are they going to, you know, retaliate anyway? And, and what does that say about their view of the WTO and of the order more broadly um, is, you know, what is their, are, are they looking at, you know, in, in, in the, at these issues in sort of philosophical terms or very practical and, you know, what is their, what is their uh, likely response? Sure, sure. Um, I, th I think it's, uh, I mean, it's some of the comments uh, that we've heard uh, and, and, and including f by me uh, imply uh, that, that China is inherently unable to be fit into the system and that they break the system no matter what. And, and I want to make sure that that's not the impression that I was giving. I think when the Chinese were trying to join the WTO and in the few, first few years after, uh, the Chinese were led by a group of, of, of policymakers that I consider to be integrationists. They wanted to join the WTO to promote domestic economic reforms, and they believed that the other participants in the WTO believed in those rules and that participating in that system would benefit China. Um, and I think what we've seen is, is that is China's faith in that system has declined, uh, partly as a result of the global financial crisis, partly as a result of being hit with lots of anti-dumping and countervailing duty cases, which they have viewed as uh, protectionist. Um, but also a new set of Chinese leaders uh, that aren't integrationists. Um, and I don't think there's really anything that we do, positive or negative, which are going to lead them in one direction or another. I basically think that their view is, is set that industrial policy uh, needs to, to be used uh, and, and unconstrained, and they want to solidify and make that permanent. Uh, and so if the U.S were to go off the reservation, break the rules, to fight back to the Chinese. I don't think that's gonna, the Chinese are gonna finally wake up and go, oh, the rules are unfair, uh, we're now gonna break them and because of what the US has done. I think that's, that train's long left the station given, given this group. Um, but I do think um, we need to think about uh, what could be potentially effective within the scope of the rules and authority that we do have through the WTO and, and domestically, and how we might be able to nudge the Chinese back or uh, threaten them back. Because uh, if we're back in 1988 and we're back and we're trying to figure out a, a way to get the system uh, back on the rails so it works for all of us, that's going to require a, a lot of efforts. So I just want to comment on a couple, a couple other points. Um, I, you know, the, the, the WTO has been effective in dealing with the Chinese on, on, in individual cases, uh, and, but we've, we've chosen winnable cases, and, choo and, and choosing winnable cases doesn't necessarily mean that you get the cases that have the most economic impact. So the broader trend is, 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 is still largely negative, and of course the biggest gap that the WTO doesn't deal with is investment. 
uh, and many of the hugest, largest problems that we have have to do with uh, Chinese investment policy because trims uh, investment measures. It says the only thing it applies to is not very limited. Yeah, not very it just it's, just it's, you, you, it's, it's limited. It's, it's so it's limited. It just says you can't coerce technology transfer, but um, that it doesn't. It's so much it doesn't doesn't cover. So I think as a result of that, we are. Um, you know, I don't think we ought to worry too much that the Chinese are going to, you know, be more or less committed to the system because of what we do in the specific instance. Um, but I do think probably what we need to suggest to them is that our goal isn't to break the system. Our goal is to fix the system, and uh, we want them to be part of that solution rather than be the out permanent outcast of that system. Okay, I, Claire, I want you to uh, add to that, but also let me introduce one other issue which has been raised a couple times, including by Mike, about, um, or it was a question to Mike, I guess, about, um, about uh, self-initiation versus businesses um, launching cases, and Chuck, you mentioned it as well. I mean, one, when we had, um, uh, Jake was up here interviewing um, Charlene Barshevsky a couple months ago um, in connection with an Asia project we were doing, and she was asked about, um, Jake asked her about whether in hindsight when we negotiated Chinese W-2 accession, um, you know, we should have, um, we should have, we should have anticipated a different type of China that might emerge and, and might have, uh, and, and therefore negotiated tougher um, obligations on some of these issues that we're worried about today on subsidies or state-owned enterprises and so forth. And as I recall, Charlene's answer was largely, well, we did actually uh, devise some of the tools that would have addressed some of those issues, but business didn't use them. I mean, the only case that the Mike referred to, we did another number to throw out was the, he mentioned the 421 a case against tires. Um, I was in the Bush White House when this first uh, emerged as something in the early 2000s that we had to come up with cases, and it was very hard to come up with credible cases, uh, partly because well, there are a lot of reasons. Anyway, um, it, it was, um, so I just, I'm wondering, you know, how you, um, whether that's fair, whether we, we have tools that business can use them, they don't use them, that makes it harder for us to follow through again. I'd like um, Claire go first. And you can, you can okay. go ahead, Chuck, yeah. too, but first, Claire. Okay, well, for your first question about what would the China, Chinese response be to the United States if the United States came up with Section 301 remedies that were not, um, WTO violative. Let me just say, if you flipped that, if, if there were a WTO violation of what the United States did, to me, China would then have the moral high ground. And that would give them a tremendous advantage. It would give them an advantage with our allies, and it would potentially be very problematic for us. So if we don't violate the WTO, then we neutralize that issue of that high ground, okay? Now, the next question is, does the Section 301 report and the discussion of what is going on in China create a shame in China because it reveals something they are doing that is wrong, that is actually to be, um, to not be proud of, and that they can't really just brush off? Because if it does, then their response will change depending if, if, that's, if that's feasible. Because they will not want, Ch China is not a gangster state, so they're not oblivious to the, the, their reputation in the world. So if something has been revealed that is truly bad that they've done, then I think their response will be calibrated to try to correct rather than to punch you in the nose it, with nuance. Okay, but if something is done that really angers them or gets at a core, let's say you hit a national champion or you do something that really bothers them, then China is much more efficient at retaliating than we are, very efficient. And we saw it with South Korea and the bad missiles, every which way. You know, all of a sudden there were health and safety issues with the cosmetics. All of a sudden, no tourist in China wanted to go to South Korea, notwithstanding the years, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There were business licensing problems. Lots of things under the radar that were very hard to then take to the WTO even to try to restrain them. So we can anticipate, I would say, that kind of behavior depending on what happens. 
Now, answering your question about self-initiation versus the business launching cases, um, it's definitely what I guess I will say is that once a WTO case was launched, if we did that, because that is now, that's the government self-initiating, because that's the only way a WTO case works, right? It's government to government. There is no business petition. Um, prior to that, there could be pressure on business, for sure. Once the case was launched, the, uh, it, it left. So that was actually very important for the notion that they were not just undermining the system entirely. Now, because a dumping case or a countervailing duty case of these other trade remedies cases are not government sponsored, I think that pressure would potentially continue on the litigants during the time that they brought the cases. So it then brings you this paradox of you may have a very poor amount of the Chinese market. It, well, if it's a dumping case, you're worrying about their input, their influx into your market. But if you're pushing on a market access problem into China, you may have a fraction of the mar market share you should have. But because it's such a large market, you may, it may still be a significant amount of revenue. And for the company, it may be impractical for you to think about the idea that you're going to get what you are owed in principle if you jeopardize for the next period of time what you already have. Okay, thanks. Chuck. I, I think self-initiation is sort of a red herring issue. Um, uh, as Mike said, these cases, particularly dumping countervailing duty cases, can't, private companies have to be involved. So it's sort of a, you know, a charade if they're self-initiated or not. Um, I, I just don't think it's, it, it doesn't have much, as I said, I think it's sort of a red herring issue. I think dumping countervailing duty cases, if they're self-initiated, probably have already been prepared by uh, the, the parties uh, that are, are interested in the cases, and uh, it's a facade. Um, in terms of WTO cases, I think as Claire said, the government has to initiate the case. Private parties can't. Private parties can help provide information. I think that's part of what we'll see coming out of the, um, the uh, uh, um, report that uh, USTR is working on, the, the, new, the new 301 report on IP. But, you know, my former partner and friend, not former friend, but my friend and former <laughs> partner, Charlene Barshevsky, said, I, I think that um, U.S. companies uh, on, uh, on the front end of, the, of China's WTO accession uh, uh, use the type of remedies uh, extensively that they, they had to use, which were the dumping countervailing duty cases. And they use WTO market access cases. I think what has evolved uh, are now these, these forced technology, these technology-related cases, the industrial policy-related cases of which the accession agreement didn't really create tools to deal with that, as, uh, like they did with um, uh, uh, you know, uh, import-related problems. Mm -hmm. I think people actually anticipated more of a problem on imports when they were designing the WTO accession agreement. So to be fair, 421 was about surges of if, uh, that's a an import measure. It's basically. an import question. Yeah. So I, I think U.S. industry used existing tools to the extent that they could and 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 were and, and wanted to. Um, I think what this discussion showing is there are issues that. That are, there are still issues that relate to WTO violations that China has engaged with that we need to be aggressive in pursuing those WTO cases. Uh, I think there are issues that aren't covered, and we're going to have to figure out how we need a comprehensive strategy of WTO cases. Uh, we need a, a, a strategy that how can you engage China to uh, uh, um, be and other countries in the WTO to, to again be interested in negotiating comprehensive and stronger rules. I mean, I think the key is comprehensive and stronger rules, not just you know weak little work programs. And and this is going to require the U.S. to to um, have a do a much better job in cooperating with Europe and Japan and other countries. I uh, gather there was some sort of agreement signed by Europe, Japan, and the United States vis-a-vis -vis China 
uh, in Buenos Aires. I not, am not specifically mentioning China, 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 China but, but yes, they uh, agreed to work together I haven't on seen over, it, over but capacity and uh, whatever we do but. to the maximum extent possible, should we should try to do in a concerted, cooperative effort with other countries. Um, uh, but we shouldn't necessarily be afraid of, of, of having to go it alone, as we've done in the past. But we just can't keep, you know, it's, this is not a fast draw at high noon. We have to have a comprehensive policy. And I think that's what we had in the, I, I think in the 1980s what evolved was a comprehensive policy uh, where business and government were working together on how do you get something moving forward on the new areas of, as again, trips, and, trims. Right. And, and to be fair, and I, I'm not going to ask a question because I want to bring but, the audience in, but I'm going to make a comment which you can respond to in answering somebody else's question. But just, you, you alluded to this, but I, I feel like then the focus was, as you said, uh, with, it was to create tension in the system and to, or, or to create pressure valves uh, like anti-dumping and CBD. I was just talking to a former boss who at Treasury, which used to do uh, mm -hmm. as recently as the early 80s, used to do the anti-dumping and CVD stuff. I'd forgotten how recently Treasury was doing that. And, and this person was saying, you know, that it was very much a pressure valve issue. It wasn't used as a, you know, to game the system or to, you know, for protectionist purposes or for other reasons. And, and so I, again, I'm not gonna let you answer that because I need to bring the audience in, but you can, you can think about that and answer it when someone else asks you. Well, I have question. an answer. I have actually something to say regardless of what the question is going to be. So. Okay, good. <laughs> but, but, but this whole, this whole question of, 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 I think it's one thing if we use uh, um, enforcement to, uh, you know, to get people's attention and try and change, change action or behavior, but if we're using it for protection or, you know, for advantage um, of other kinds, I think that's an important, important distinction that maybe we are sometimes losing here. That's an op editorial opinion. Okay, uh, questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We have microphones. Identify yourself and uh, and do ask a question. And this gentleman here. Hi, uh, Dan Crocker with the American Foreign Service Association and a Foreign Service Officer at Commerce Department as well. I'm curious when we talk about the gaps in our sort of a trade enforcement toolkit, especially focused on the overseas market access issues, as Claire raised, uh, the extent to which you see the Foreign Service and our U.S. embassies and consulates playing a, playing a constructive role there, especially for all of those companies that do not want to actually try to escalate and pay all the legal fees associated with escalation at the WTO level. Thank you. It's good to pay legal fees. <laughs> Do you want to answer that? I, it wasn't so, really a question. I, again, a I'll go back to, I mean, I, I don't think I'm daughtering yet, uh, old man, but I go back a lot to what happened in the 80s. I think that the embassies and the, 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 the commerce, USTR, state, and business had a remarkably close working relationship to build support for the GATs, for, w, for the GAT taking up the services and intellectual property. The business community launched coalitions that were particularly well endowed that traveled the world and met with uh, their counterparts uh, in Europe and Asia, in Latin America, Africa, to discuss why it sh GATT should take up these new issues to close the loopholes in, in, in the, the, the gaps in, in the international system. And the embassies and, uh, uh, and the, the government agencies played a very important role in setting those meetings up and making sure that the private sector, when they arrived in a country, saw the right business people and saw the right government officials. Uh, more of that needs to be done. Uh, what was particularly interesting on trips after a great deal of reluctance by the Japanese and Europeans to even, cons uh, European businesses, to even consider, let alone governments, to consider having intellectual property raised in, in, in the GATT. Ultimately, they came along and a coalition developed between UNICE, which was then business, it's now Business Europe, I think it's called. It was all, the Association of Associations, and the KDONRAN and the US coalition to the point that to demonstrate the, the, that you could do TRIPS, uh, develop a TRIPS agreement, the three groups actually negotiated a model TRIPS agreement. And they released it in a joint press conference in Europe, Japan, and the United States all timed together. And it actually became a model, as I think Mike knows, became a, a, a little bit of a, a, a roadmap for, for the negotiations. So 
I think government plays an important role. Can I, can I just yeah, make sure. another, just Good. sort of... Um, In helping business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the on-the-ground part shouldn't be underestimated, at least when it... Uh, I'll speak again to China, which is what I know. There are times when either the folks in the embassy, their consulates, pick up something from a company on the ground and help tie the company into the system so that the issue can be resolved. And there are practical things that happen in intellectual property, for example, where there's really a very good network for trying to resolve things. So you're not actually raising it to a WTO case. It can get fixed. Sometimes there's a local problem with someone being aberrant, and you can actually get it fixed quickly. Um, and then it goes the other way, too, of just providing additional context and information when you're trying to solve a problem. Yeah. So either a commercial problem or a more systemic issue. It's yeah. very, very important. Yeah. Another advertisement for having uh, a strong you know, commercial diplomacy and economic yeah. diplomacy yeah. Uh, 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 capability. And thank you all who've done yeah. that for your service. I always uh, want to emphasize that's how important all of that is. This gentleman here, you wanted your rebuttal on Europe, and then uh, if there's a third question, I'll take them all as a batch. To the second row, yeah. Uh, hi, my name is An Schumer, reporter with Inside US Trade. Thanks to the panel. I wanted to ask something about that, that came up uh, in the discussion with Ambassador Froman, um, and that's the issue of uh, self-declaration of development status at the WTO. I think that's, Ambassador Lai has mentioned that at the, his opening remarks at MC11. It's been an issue at MC11, I think, preventing a ministerial outcome. So I wanted to ask the panel, you know, what do you think about the issue of self-declaration of development? Is that an issue that could be resolved eventually with the WTO, or is that just going to lead to paralysis in Geneva? Okay, development, uh, that is an issue. Yes, sir. This gentleman here. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Jean-François Wattin, again, sorry. But I have a right of rebuttal. Uh, on trips, <laughs> you know, I was the uh, uh, French rep to the GAD during the World of the Order Round, uh, and boy, did we like to address trips because we needed uh, to have inside the country people who would argue for success as opposed to farmers who had limited enthusiasm for new disciplines on the common agricultural policy. Uh, so. We pushed for trips uh, as, as much as we could. On gaps in the WTO, my remembrance, but I might be wrong, is that there has always been very limited enthusiasm on the part of the US to have competition or investment being part of the uh, negotiations. And I think the US delegation was very happy to push that aside, if I remember correctly, in the Singapore ministerial. You're uh, correct, you're correct. And last uh, question maybe to uh, 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 Scott. Wh what's wrong with China asking 3 million uh, public officials to get uh, China-made uh, electric vehicles? Uh, in this country, I don't see many officials riding other than US-made cars. And then you can choose your industrial policy. So China is for electric vehicles and uh, artificial intelligence. The U.S. is for coal and steel. What's wrong with that? Okay, uh, one more in that cluster, and then we'll, okay, there's a gentleman way in the back. Hi, uh, John Magnus. Just wondered if, um, in talking about the issues you were just covering, whether um, you all could say a word about Super 301. Super uh, 301. Which, which was, a design a to, from the past. Designed to produce a sort of a steady stream of self-initiated enforcement efforts clustered where the economics were most important yeah. um, uh, and regardless of whether the affected U.S. companies had the vapors. So I just wonder the, uh, what, what, you, what you think about that, the that tool. The special the temporary uh, provision in the 88 Trade Act that allowed or required USTR to identify yeah. countries of concern and sectors of concern and take cases, right? Um, okay, so we've got a question about development, and let me uh, elaborate on that about, does China really believe it? It hangs out with the group of 33, you know, the paragons of the liberal order like Zimbabwe and Venezuela. Does it really believe it's, those, are, those are its peers um, and that it's part of that group, or, or is this an act that it's covering up, you know, stuff it wants to do anyway? That's the development question, and then there's, I guess, the, the rebuttal plus the question about electronic vehicles for you, uh, Scott. And competition investment, uh, Chuck, interested in what, whether you think the U.S. was 
and why um, not so enthusiastic. And anybody who wants to take on the Super 301, Scott? Sure. All right. Uh, so let's deal with the developing country question first. Um, uh, in, if you go to Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Hong Kong, not a developing country. Developed. Highly developed. More developed than us. But of course, lots of other places uh, that are much poorer, much less developed. Um, and certainly, from the perspective of a Chinese official in Beijing who is thinking about what will be the effect in opening this market for the poorer parts of the country, those that are less competitive, um, it's a, a reasonable that they would understand that there could be job losses or transfers from domestic companies to foreign companies. Um, but, I, but I think increasingly Chinese recognize that the reality is, is, is that they need to be treated and that they're viewed as an advanced economy uh, where we are competing head to head uh, and, and hiding behind a developing country uh, veil isn't, isn't going to wash anymore. So um, it, it's, it's good theater. It, it's um, certainly about self-identity. Um, and you know the Chinese never wanted to join the OECD, in part not uh, because of, of, of what it was like to, to consider themselves in that type of group. Uh, but I, I think they're getting there. The, the, I think the brain has uh, shifted, the heart is yet uh, to, to change. In terms of uh, Chinese-made vehicles, um, I think uh, there's two points that can be, be made here. The, the first is, is that um, I don't think the U.S. is being hypocritical on this. Uh, lots of, uh, whether it's, it's car parts, or, or many other aspects of government procurement in the United States, uh, foreign companies participate in that very large market. Um, in, in China, uh, when they signed on to the WTO, we said, uh, I think, I forget what the specific language was, uh, Claire and Chuck can remind me, but it was the Chinese were going to join the government procurement agreement at the earliest possible date. Uh, well, those negotiations, I think the last time we had a serious conversation about that was as Claire was still in government probably the last uh, the time that we've talked about it, and uh, the prospects for, for that are very small. So this then gets to that, that big space that, that Chuck mentioned about the gaps. All right, so yes, they are not in, in non-compliance on government procurement agreement, but it is but given the size of China's government, and then you throw in hospitals, libraries, universities, things that could be, that the Chinese have said should be treated as public entities uh, and, and not have to be forced, not be treated as, as sort of part of the regular market, that is a huge, huge market uh, and, and needs to be addressed. And as long as China is not a signatory to the government procurement agreement uh, in a meaningful way, uh, then that is a, a, a big challenge uh, for us and is understood to be uh, unfair and needs to be dealt with. Okay, Can I just do a two finger on the uh, development status? When China acceded to the WTO, there were some provisions that were negotiated where they did not take developing country status, um, in particular with regard to um, some of the trade remedies actions. So um, it's, it was a mixed picture even in 2001. Okay, thanks, Jack. Um, three, three comments. On Super 301, John asked about. I, my, my feeling about that was always it was political theater more than operational and that the, the real operational side was the bifurcation of 301. And at least as I look back at this, I think the pressure to bring 301 cases began to dissipate after 88 because the Uruguay round was beginning to move forward. And, 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 and the, the, uh, the driving forces in a lot of the business community in terms of, as they originally thought about cases, uh, 301 type cases, they, th those, those uh, hopes, anxieties were being dealt with in the Uruguay round as it had the TRIPS negotiation, the GATS negotiations, and I think some of the pressure came off, but John, I never thought of, at least the way I looked at 301, Super 301, I, I never saw it as operational. It was just a political theater to some extent. Um, and the competition investment policy, I think, you know, I served on, on the commission that looked at the competition policy issue. And I think there was a real 
uh, the U.S. had real difficulty uh, in in reconciling. And, and, and how do you how do you deal with it because of the Justice Department as well as uh, 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 the trade related elements of it? And and I think there was a great fear, and I think legitimate fear in the terms of dispute settlement. That how do you do dispute settlement competition policy? These are such fact driven uh, cases. Uh, that uh, much too complicated, uh, as well as uh, um, it would probably be, it was more effective, and I think it is more effective, that what it led to, the fact that we did not have a competition policy negotiation, you saw the Justice Department negotiating a lot of bilateral agreements, uh, and I think there are even some multilateral agreements on co uh, competition policy cooperation in, in different types of situation. Um, uh, on, an, on investment, you know, we also had at one time the OECD initiative. What was it? MAI. M MAI. MAI. Multilateral agreement yeah, investment. We always used to get confused and talk about MIA. <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, and I think, I think there was a real concern, and I think a legitimate concern, uh, as one looked at those negotiations, how quickly they began to sink to a very low common denominator in dealing with investment protections. And therefore, if that was happening in the OECD, which had the industrialized countries, taking it into the GATT, there was a lot of fear. So I think that informed the US position at the time. <clears throat> Whether that would change today if they wanted to do something on investment in the WTO or not, I don't know. The, the final comment I would like to make, uh, Claire talked a bit about the DSU. I, I think DSU is very important. But I am the dispute settlement understanding in the, in the WTO. I, I do have, I am concerned from t about, you know, to what extent is it actually in some ways acting as more of a drag than a lift to the WTO fulfilling its role as a negotiating entity. I mean, there's a wonderful, if you look, I think it's still on the WTO website. They have a, a, a you go to the section, what is the WTO, and they have a wonderful ditty it's a bird, it's a plane, and they don't, they don't conclude it's Superman, but they basically, the conclusion, it's a negotiating forum. And that's pretty sad right now because it's not a negotiating forum. And I am somewhat concerned to what extent does dispute settlement, which has exacerbated uh, uh, a conflict between legalists and pragmatists in trade negotiations, that you know, you have, and look at China. The rules help China right now. They're not, China can do a lot of things that are not covered by the rules, and therefore they can't be brought to dispute settlement. There's a lot you can do, free cases, but a lot you can't challenge China under the WTO. And why should they negotiate new, new uh, uh, agreements that have stronger rules in the areas not covered. So the DSU may be eliminating, is it having a drag on the incentive? The other is, and I, I have not been a, you know, I've been a private sector party to negotiator. I, Mike Smith's here and, and, and John Verano's here. I don't think Mike's here and we have some other negotiators in the room. Uh, but I certainly, if I was a negotiator, would be very worried these days about, um, uh, uh, could I use, as was used in the past by negotiators successfully, deliberate ambiguity to uh, reach an objective so you can have an agreement? And, uh, or as a negotiator today, because of the DSU and the panels and the appellate body, would I want to, as a careful lawyer in private practice, every dot T has to be crossed and every I dotted uh, because I am not going to have to go back to, want to go back to Congress and say, well, we left, you know, there was an ambiguous provision. And I think that's what's happened with respect to 17.6 of the anti-dumping agreement, which I think uh, uh, it was designed to create, at least from the U.S. perspective, a Chevron type test, which is deference to the Commerce Department and the ITC. And the argument is, the, uh, and it's uh, for another panel, that it's being read out of the, the agreement and that U.S. negotiators maybe did not, were not dotting every I and crossing every T to achieve the objective they wanted. So as a negotiator today, 
I mean, if we're pressuring, if we're under that pressure, how do you negotiate agreements? Because ambiguities in negotiation, even in commercial negotiations, are sometimes what makes the deal go forward. Can I just oh, say oh, one? Okay, one say, final just one, one small thing, which is, you take the idea that the, D, the dispute settlement side could be the drag on the system, but I will tell you that if you have rules that are binding behavior, and you look at a country like China, you know, and many of these issues, we would go to China, we would describe the rules, we would say that the rules, they were not in compliance, and nothing happened until you took them to the dispute settlement process, demonstrating that you were going to use this tool that was going to come up with an answer that maybe they weren't gonna like, that things changed. So I think we have, this is this delicate balance and it's probably what the next panel has to try to grapple with of how do you on the one hand not create that problem that Chuck described, but on the other hand, going back to the idea that everybody talks to each other in terms of countries that are good at talking and taffy pulling, you know, the idea of you just keep talking and you never have an answer, they're, they're extremely good at that. So if we want, to hold people, I think dispute settlement has a role. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're going to have to stop because I got to let people take a break. And 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 you already challenged the next panel to take on some of this. And I'm going to add to that challenge by saying that that Ambassador Lighthizer put down a few markers. Actually, not interestingly, at least not explicitly, he didn't mention the dispute settlement mechanism. But on on Monday in his speech, in addition to the development uh, uh, charade. He, um, he highlighted uh, the fact that the WTO is losing its f focus as a negotiating forum and becoming a litigation-centered organization. He said members are circ circumventing rules on notifications and transparency. U.S. wants to revive the standing bodies, take on new challenges such as overcapacity and over SOEs. So even though I want you to talk about solving all the problems that we've <laughs> left behind for you here in the next panel, you know, please comment on that set of challenges to the system. I'm interested in whether you agree or disagree. And, uh, so with that, please thank this panel uh, for a terrific <laughs> set of presentations. Um,
Thank you to those of you who uh, followed Matt's guidance and returned uh, uh, promptly. We do appreciate that. Uh, this is one of the riskiest parts of uh, putting on a conference is managing the coffee break. <laughs> so you worry about losing your entire audience. I'm delighted we didn't. So, uh, so thank you and welcome back. We'll give the people a minute or two to settle here. <clears throat> Well, thank you, and uh, welcome back. My name is Scott Miller. I'm the uh, senior advisor here at CSIS. I hold a shoal chair in international business, and I'm basically the resident trade wonk. So um, I'm delighted, delighted to be part of this. Our first panel uh, set a very high bar for both information and entertainment value, uh, which we will try to live up to. I, I'm not sure how we'll do. You can tell me at the end, but uh, I do appreciate that. It's interesting. Uh, this is uh, the second. Uh, Simon Chair event in two weeks that has had a, had a significant reference to the 1980s. Uh, the one last week was uh, a book event for Danny Roderick of uh, Harvard University, and one of the comparisons he makes about the political economy for trade and, and international economic policy today is actually quite similar to the early 1980s in the United States. <clears throat> Certainly the previous panel uh, discuss that, and it's it, it really it's it's surprising, you know, how uh, the 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 parallels, the similarities. Uh, part of it is we have some of the '80s people back in uh, in government again, but which is which is always interesting. But the U.S. political economy in that period of time that that was that was very difficult for trade policy, but resulted in the 1988 Trade Act and other statutes that we're still relying on today for enforcement. We had we were just pulling out of the 70s stagflation. And in that case here, we're pulling out of the relatively sluggish growth post the Great Recession. We had a challenge from an export-led uh, growth economy. In that case, it was Japan. Uh, there was consolidation in Europe that was concerning US uh, export interests. So a lot of similarities and a lot of, a lot of things going on. That now we, our, our panel's job is to, is to take uh, what the first panel discussed and see wh where do we go in today's political economy in today's trading system and today's world economy. And uh, so I have a terrific panel to take that question on. Uh, uh, we, have, uh, we have an academic, uh, in fact, the, I think the premier academic on this issue. Chad Bone is from uh, our neighbor up the street, Peterson Institute for International Economics. Go to PIE.com, click Bone, and look at his publications. No, it's dot com. Yeah. Uh, and clip on, click, click on Chad's publications, you'll see he's written extensively for several years on this very topic, on the topic of how trade rules work in the current environment. So we're delighted to have him here today. We're also delighted to have a, a worthy occupant of the, the interesting sock chair, uh, for, if you noticed in the previous panel. So uh, Chad, thanks for being here. And we also have two practitioners with us with, uh, with interesting backgrounds in government that we're going to draw on as well. You have their bios in front of you. Bruce Hirsch. Uh, was at, uh, in an earlier incarnation the uh, Trade Council of the Senate Finance Committee. And John Verno, who's uh, in pra also in practice now, was General Counsel of USTR among other roles, including Deputy USTR. So we're delighted to have them to, to reflect on not just how circumstances have changed, but how American policy winds up looking to the future given our dispersed powers and given the fractious nature of trade policy in a domestic context. So with that, I'm gonna ask Chad to start us off. Uh, and then turn to Bruce and John, and then we'll interact with each other in the, in the, in the audience. So, Chad. So thanks for um, the invitation to be here. I'm gonna touch my phone, not because uh, I'm watching to see what the ministerial uh, outcome is going to be, uh, though feel free if anything happens to let me know, um, but I wanna make sure that I set my watch so I don't end up going over time. Um, so indeed, uh, I, I guess I should also begin by saying, I think what distinguishes me from everybody else that you will have heard of today are maybe two things. So first, uh, I think I'm the only PhD economist up here. So I think my job is thus to put numbers on things. Uh, so I will try to do a little bit of that and some structure as to how economists kind of think about these issues. The second is I think I'm the only one up here with a trade policy podcast. Right. Um, so if you haven't checked it out, it's called Trade Talks, I would do so. But in looking at the numbers, we've put out 15 or 16 episodes thus far this fall, and roughly half are about this issue uh, of, of trade enforcement, anti-dumping, trade remedies that have come up. So that just is to, uh, one metric just to say just how important I think that, that it ultimately is. Okay, so um, let me talk first about when we're thinking about the toolkit 
Uh, I think of there's thus far the discussion this morning, we've talked about really two different sides of it. Uh, dealing with import competition and then dealing with the export side, right? And so this falls briefly, you're going to, you know, trade remedies, anti-dumping, countervail, uh, safeguards, the national security cases versus the Section 301, um, potentially dispute settlement. Though I'll, I'll argue that dispute settlement ties into this, even the first bucket, a, a little bit as well. Okay, but let's talk about the first bucket, the trade remedy side. Um, so for, for 20 years as an academic economist, I've been working on this issue and collecting data on this, not only for what the United States has been doing through use of anti-dumping, countervail safeguards, but what countries around the world have been doing as well. And what's happened, especially over the last 15 years since, WTO, since China's WTO accession, is these have really become a policy to deal with China. So looking at the data before China gets into the WTO for the United States, it's only about 2% or so of China's exports to the US are affected by these kinds of policies. But nowadays, it's about 9%, a bit over 9%, right? Uh, and so it becomes a big deal. Over that same time period, the use of trade remedies, anti-dumping CVDs against other countries by the United States has fallen dramatically. So now it's only you know, 2% of our imports from the rest of the world. This is really, really a China issue. And so when we're thinking about the enforcement toolkit, it has inevitably come, uh, come to the issue of thinking about how to deal with China. Um, now, as an economist, uh, how do I think about especially laws like anti-dumping? So anti-dumping is the most frequently invoked of these laws in the United States and in countries around the world. Well, one of the problems from an economist's perspective is the law was broken when it was first written. It doesn't make economic sense. The things that you're not allowed to do under anti-dumping law, you're, perf you're perfectly able to do under domestic law, right? So you're able under certain circumstances to, to, to sell below cost or to price discriminate against different segments within the United States market. It's only when these things start to cross borders that we become very concerned about it. So from an economist's perspective, it's hard to make sense of why we have the anti-dumping law written as it is in the first place. We understand that it has to be about something else then, right? It's not, it's not about predation, because there's nothing about predation written into the law. It has to be about something else. So then the question is, what are the kinds of things that we're worried about, and have those been shifting over time? And I think the answer to that is clearly yes. So when we're talking about the use of anti-dumping uh, in the 1980s in, in the Japan context, mm -hmm. it's very different than, than, than what it was, or the, what we're concerned about with China and its uh, incomplete transformation today into becoming a market-oriented economy. And I think that's, that's important to draw those distinctions because it then gets into the issue of what the right uh, toolkit is and how to administer laws like that in order to deal with this underlying concern. So in thinking about this within the context of the United, United States a little bit more specifically, I think the other interesting empirical thing to note is how the United States has used trade remedies with respect to China is beginning in 2007, the United States not only used anti-dumping in this non-market economy status of, of you know, we're able to treat imports from China differently in these investigations using surrogate country uh, prices and costs to be able to make it somewhat easier on, on the administrators of commerce to, to come up with dumping margins. But in 2007, we also started to begin to use the countervailing duty law simultaneously. So virtually all anti-dumping cases that have been brought against China since 2007 have a simultaneous countervailing duty counterpart where we've developed alternative methodologies to deal with imports from China, not necessarily treating them across the board uh, as you know, a surrogate country, say, you know, we're going to look at a, the, the comparable steel firm from India and use their costs and in, in, in prices. What we're going to do instead is we're going to use a hodgepodge kind of approach. And so we may take, for thinking about a steel case on, on pipe, we may take uh, some of the input costs from India, um, but we're going to use other input costs as well. So, in, you know, out of recognition that some elements of the Chinese market may be getting liberalized and may be becoming more market-oriented, but others are not. The banking sector, for example, if there are subsidized loans, we can't rely on the Chinese interest rates. Well, let's look at what the average interest rates are from lots of countries that are like China. Uh, if we think that the key input, like hot rolled steel, if we're talking about a downstream steel product, is being provided at subsidized prices because the hot rolled steel producers within China are state-owned enterprises, and they can thus implicitly subsidize downstream downstream producers, well then let's look at hot rolled steel prices from world markets. Same thing with land rents, things like that. So that's the approach that the United States has been developing since 2007. 
Um, I don't think necessarily strategically, but arguably to get to the point of today where if in the WTO context, in this dispute that the United States and the European Union face right now that China has brought about this non-market economy status issue, the United States is told you can't use non-market economy treatment under anti-dumping law, we have this backup policy in place that we could be deploying instead. And I think what's interesting is the European Union just rolled out last week revisions to their anti-dumping law. And it seems by my read that they've adopted many of the same approaches that the European or that the United States is doing under its CVD law vis-a-vis um, -vis China. So I think that's an important area. I think the, the one other point that I want to touch on um, before, I, before I conclude is um, this issue of the inability of the United States to go it alone on this issue. And so when we're having this conversation about reforming uh, the trade enforcement provisions of the United States, we have to think about this within the context of both the international rules, but then also the countries out there that are in the same position that the United States is. And why does that matter? Well, think about the big issues that have come up on the trade remedy agenda this year. So steel and aluminum under the national security cases, uh, this solar panel case under the Section 201. What do they all have in common? Well, they all have in common that the United States, because under anti-dumping countervailing duty law, has largely stopped the imports from China, the main source of the underlying problem, whether it's overcapacity, if you're talking about steel and aluminum, or subsidies, if you're talking about solar. Uh, we stopped the imports from China directly from coming in, but that doesn't solve the underlying problem, right? China exports these products into third markets or sets up multinational, or multinationals get up in, in, in third markets. World prices for these things are low, and other countries then start exporting to the United States instead. And so the issue is still there if you're in the steel or the aluminum industry, but now these tools aren't going to deal with the underlying problem. And so this is where, to my mind, you need to complement the domestic trade remedies with use, as, as Claire was articulating, of dispute settlement, right? You need to actually attack the problem at its source, which is the overcapacity problem. If we're talking about aluminum and steel, um, maybe subsidies. These have to go hand in hand because using just one, especially the trade remedy side, is not going to do it by itself, primarily because you're going to end up hitting, you know, as we saw the, 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 in, the, in the steel and aluminum cases, imports from our trading partners, right? And then they get up in arms, they start to have to threaten to retaliate, and this sort of undermines uh, a global or a more global approach to addressing what I think is the, the fundamental underlying issue, which is this problem in, in, in tension that's going on right now with China. So we're there, I'll, I'll stop, thanks. Thanks, Chad. <clears throat> Let me turn to Bruce. And Bruce, you were, had, had, had involvement at, at fairly deep levels in both what became the Trade Act of 2002 and the uh, Trade Priorities Act of 2015. And just an observation is versus, say, the prior editions of Trade Act of 88 or 74, uh, there was much less attention paid to sort of resolving the kinds of problems we're talking about today. And uh, maybe you can, uh, you can comment on any, anything you want, but in context, one of the reasons we're reaching back to the, to, to the 80s mm -hmm. is there were different issues more recently, and what do you an anticipate uh, that means for a future Congress, if you could if you just touch on that? But sure. Um, you know, I, I think in the context of those acts, what you saw uh, was, uh, well, there wasn't the same focus on, as has been drawn these days about the, the absence or the, the challenge of, of developing new rules mm -hmm. uh, to deal with uh, these problems. Rather. Uh, there was a more traditional approach taken, which was to view the issue as one of resources um, mm -hmm. and one of, of handling uh, technical issues in the context of, as had been mentioned earlier, anti-dumping duty evasion and such. And so there were, there were those kinds of technical improvements, but there were also um, you know, just the view that there was an assumption made that WTO dispute settlement was useful, yes. was effective, and that the problems that needed to be dealt with were really resource driven. Mm -hmm. And so the, uh, the act set up an interagency group to help to research and gather information on cases. It, it mm -hmm. funded that group. Um, but it all was based on this assumption that WTO cases are, 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 are useful. Um, I think more generally, uh, in terms of the attitudes of Congress, that's consistent with you know, the, the, the approach over the decades mm -hmm. that you know, they've uh, pushed uh, the administration to uh, use the, the tools available on behalf of their constituents, uh, often in the context of steel or uh, aluminum or lumber or solar panels, that means 
using domestic remedies, trade remedies, and, and protection. Um, but it, it's also meant use, you know, you know, pushing on the WTO side. So you'll see that even those who have criticized uh, WTO dispute settlement for overreaching and, and overly mm -hmm. limiting, for example, trade remedies, are, are still and have been pushing for mm -hmm. greater use. Uh, you know, right now, uh, there's, there's a bill which um, Congressman Pascrell and others have introduced, which mimics uh, a number of, of democratic bills that have been introduced over the, over the last 20 years, which on the one hand would set up a commission to observe uh, and comment on overreach, but would also set up a congressional trade enforcer which, who was specifically um, intended to push the administration to bring more WTO cases. Mm -hmm. So there was never this sense that the WTO was a problem. Um, now, in the current context, you know, everybody is dealing with, with a very new environment because you know, the administration's uh, preference for unilateralism appears, at least the rhetoric, uh, to uh, view the WTO more as a hindrance to the use of that unilateralism mm -hmm and to the effective use of trade remedies than as a tool to use, uh, at, at least at, at the moment. Um, you know, you have President Trump's very clear statement to that effect in Vietnam, um, where he said, you know, multilateral agreements are tying our hands and making meaningful enforcement practically impossible. Uh, you had Secretary Ross several months ago commenting that MFN likewise helps to tie our hands. And you had Ambassador Lighthizer's comments here a few months ago in which he was discussing the um, very favorably gap uh, dispute settlement, um, <laughs> not from the perspective of um, uh, helping to create space for pushing forward new rules, but mm -hmm. rather uh, because it, in some sense, seemed was it allowed for unilateralism and, and it was therefore more effective. Um, so you know, the, I think Congress is, 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 is coming to terms with this. Um, it's very early to judge whether the rhetoric is going to be matched by actions. Uh, we're still waiting on the results on the 301. We're still waiting on the results of the 232. Uh, with regard to WTO cases, uh, while the administration initially uh, hesitated to move forward with cases that the Obama administration had initiated on agriculture, they have, under pressure from the ag community and from Congress, uh, advanced that case. Mm -hmm. The other case which they have not advanced, though, is aluminum, which also happens to be the subject of potential unilateral action in, in, the, in the form of a 232. So, you know, is there a relationship there? Um, you, you know, more broadly, uh, in terms of congressional attitudes, uh, you know, over the, the decades, the, the assumption has always been where over time it is, there's been increasing confidence that the administration uh, was going to effectively use discretion that they were given to responsibly and carefully advocate for U.S. interests uh, on the export side. Um, and as a result, and, and, you know, this is not only in the context of trade promotion authority, but just the general authority which was granted to the administration. So you have a USTR who has very, very broad authority now um, in the context of S Section 301, but more generally to represent the United States, which Congress has always felt very comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, uh, that comfort is um, somewhat diminished lately. Um, and, you know, you, you saw at least one sign of that extremely early in the administration in January when Senator Lee introduced a bill that would have required any duty increase to be approved mm -hmm. by Congress. And you also see in the context of the NAFTA discussion, uh, lots of debates about what, how this authority can be reined in. Uh, so you know, I, I would just, you know, some food for thought on the, on the congressional front. front. Um, if I could comment on a couple of other elements sure. of, of um, helping to improve the enforcement uh, tools available. Um, it, we've already discussed uh, the fact that the rules in certain areas are deficient and you can't enforce rules if, they, if they're deficient or they don't exist. Um, and you know, Ambassador Froman has already referred to uh, the fact that some of these rules, at least, we had developed in the context of TPP. And uh, I guess the point I would make there is, um, or just elaborate on, is you know, how do you move those negotiations forward? How do you move those rules forward? 
and while in, in the 80s, um, you know, Section 301 might have been part of a, a, a broader set of measures that helped to create tension to uh, advance the Bolin negotiations, uh, at this point, the, really, the, given the, the, the stalemate of the WTO, it is the use of regional agreements that has been you know, most, most critical. Mm -hmm. And TPP was going to be important, not simply for developing rules among the, the countries who were party to it, but because it was exercising gravitational force for others in the region who wanted to join it, mm -hmm. and who were already even not as parties trying to comply with many of its terms in order to have the opportunity to join it later. And so the, the use of this kind of forum to advance uh, the rules was very important, both directly, but also at the WTO. Mm -hmm. Because uh, at the WTO, what we've seen consistently is uh, members that have taken on ambitious uh, commitments in the context of, of free trade agreements are taking that ambition into the WTO. Mm -hmm. And so here as well, if we're going to be solving problems like uh, deficient uh, rules on state-owned enterprises or on digital trade, we need to be able to per, uh, pursue that, that in, in these other fora. And that, that gets back to the issue of cooperation mm -hmm. and um, how important it will be to cooperate with our allies and um, in that connection um, use our, our, the tools that we are applying here domestically um, in a, a manner which is, is not going to alienate uh, our allies and make cooperation more difficult um, and will, as, as Claire said, in, at least in the instance of, of, of working uh, on Chinese issues, uh, avoid giving China the high ground, the high moral ground. Mm -hmm. I'll stop there. Excellent, thanks. John, if you could pick up where Bruce left off and talk about particularly your experience in the General Counsel and using the WTO dispute settlement system and managing cases uh, the, both uh, Ambassador Froman and the previous panel mentioned there is, over time, a pretty obvious selection bias in that economies tend to bring cases, members bring cases, they're fairly certain they can win. Part of that, of course, is the time and effort required. Part of it is prestige of uh, losing a case, is, is a loss of prestige in losing a case that should have won. Some of them, there are ambiguous rules and it's unlikely to succeed. But talk about the judgments that go on and this, this balance, and particularly the way those decisions are balanced to address the cooperative sides of trade. Um, thanks, Scott. Um, you know, I think it's all about leverage. I mean, mm -hmm. and you have different tools in the toolbox, sometimes going to Geneva um, is the appropriate and necessary leverage uh, to get a result. But for the reasons that, that Chad laid out at the beginning, I think what we're struggling with and what most of the trade enforcement dialogue is around is around China, and it's because of the scale. Mm -hmm. And you know, in fairness to China, many of the, while they are clearly more mercantilist in many of their behaviors today than many of us thought a decade ago, many of their policies are not uh, new to China. They were policies adopted by other countries, including this country at different points in time. But I think it's the scale that is mm -hmm. creating major problems in the system and tension in the system. And we need new leverage, new tools of leverage to move China to a different place. And it's a mutually uh, beneficial and important relationship. Um, but the DSU, and here I want to pick up with, on something that, that, that Chuck Levy said in, in the last panel. The, the DSU was intended as a, as a sword to go after unfair trade practices against uh, trade violations, and it has been effective and continues to be effective in that way. But unfortunately, it's also been used as a shield. So if a country wants to do something that is against the spirit, if not the law, of the WTO agreements, when other countries that are bound by the DSU say, well, I want to respond um, not simply by threatening a WTO case, but unilaterally to get some leverage, the DSU says, no, 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 no. You cannot <laughs> unilaterally act in the way you could, mm -hmm. you know, in the 1980s. And I think that is the crux of the problem today. And, uh, and I think what we're, I think what this administration is struggling with and what others are struggling with is 
how do we sort of not throw the baby out with the bathwater, mm -hmm. as others yes. have said, because um, we like the baby. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but we also need to not um, allow the DSU to uh, dis disable us from having leverage to move other countries, China, but not exclusively China, to a different place. And, you know, if you look at, you know, any dispute settlement system, it has to have, in my view, three sort of components. It has to have clear rules, mm -hmm. it has to have buy-in, and it has to have an effective dispute settlement process. And again, as Chuck said, a lot of these agreements, they're inter like other international agreements, you know, there's some constructive ambiguity in some parts of them, and that's what you need mm -hmm. to get the deal. Um, but it really comes back to bite you when you go to enforce that constructive ambiguity, because it's like nailing jello to the wall. You just can't do it. Mm -hmm. And so you're left with this situation where it's unsatisfactory to us, because we're saying, gee, what you're doing is unfair and, and against the spirit, if not the, the rules, but you're not going to convince a Geneva panel, um, which creates, which raises another problem. We don't want Geneva panels, the dispute settlement bodies, the panels or the appellate body, to be filling gaps. Mm -hmm. That is what courts of equity do in our system and in other countries, and for good or bad, we are comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And we recognize that, you know what, at the end of the day, you need uh, wise judges who can um, look at the totality of circumstances and make an assessment of what is fair and appropriate. We don't want the appellate body to do that, uh, and I think for good reason. But then that leads you to, okay, well that means we can't have agreements with ambiguity, because we don't want the judges, if you will, to fill the gaps. So we need um, agreements that look like purchase and sale agreements when you go to buy a home, which have, you know, thick, uh, which are thick and cover every contingency. Now as a lawyer, I like those thick agreements right. because that's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed yeah. to yeah. anticipate uh, contingencies. And when you find out when you move into the house and the nice rose bushes in the front yard have all been ripped out, you go to page 73 and you go, the shrubs convey with the property. Problem solved. Yeah. But we're never going to have trade agreements that have the granularity of these trade agreements. Mm -hmm. and we have to accept that. So I think in the end we, we, we're struggling with um, a very large animal in the forest which operates in a more interventionist way than most other countries in the club do. And, and to that extent, they are not playing by, quote, the rules that others are playing by. Um, so there isn't the buy-in to have a, a hands-off approach to managing the economy. And as, as, as Scott Kennedy was saying in the first panel, China today is very different than it was 30 years ago in terms of its statist intervention, but it's still more interventionist mm -hmm. than certainly the U.S. company, most uh, country, most European countries, et cetera, and because of the scale it's creating this tension. So I think until we uh, figure out how to get leverage outside of the DSU, we will struggle with moving this relationship to a place that um, uh, preserves the best parts, of which there are many, uh, and, but addresses some of the tensions at the end. And let me just say at the, at the last point, um, trade enforcement gets a lot of attention today because trade gets a lot of attention. And I think it's important that we, we as much as I would like to think that there is no issue in the world that wouldn't benefit from hiring a trade lawyer in Washington, <laughs> Um, you know, the U.S. economy, like every other U economy in the world, its success is going to be determined by policies within the border, not the policies at the border. Mm -hmm. And I worry that we had, you know, an election last year, you know, that you would think trade policies are the dominant force uh, for good or evil in the economy, mm -hmm. and they simply are not. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the loudest voices 
claiming that trade agreements are not being enforced happen to also be those who are most opposed to trade, period. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to keep in mind that most countries, most of the time, including China, abide by their commitments. And we will struggle, like every generation of participants in the trade policy debate, with new challenges. And the new challenge right now is China and some of its um, state policies and how they jive or don't, or don't jive with the rest of the world's economy. Very helpful. Well, let me, let me take where you sort of left off and have a question for the panel about is there hope for negotiation? I mean, one way to improve rules is through negotiation. Uh, it ha and certainly, uh, we seem to have gotten the rest of the WTO members' attention with our actions uh, not seating uh, members of the uh, appellate body, that we have some concerns about the DSU and, and they might be addressed. But addressing them through negotiation carries with it this, the ambiguity that you talked about. I mean, I, as a recovering lobbyist, I, I recall well uh, explaining to members of Congress in roughly 2005 or six that yes, we were changing U.S. tax law. Uh, this was the Fisk ETI case. We, were, we, were, we had to change U.S. tax laws because we lost a trade case. And the reason we lost the trade case is basically Europe got their footnote and we didn't get ours. <laughs> you know, and it wasn't very satisfactory <laughs> explanation. But uh, knowing that and knowing what you know about negotiation, regardless of who's in charge, is there, is there a negotiated solution for this in sight? Or what would have to happen to make one there? Well, my, I mean, I, I think we have to accept that the Doha round floundered. I mean, I remember a long time ago now, but I remember like it was yesterday being in Cancun with Ambassador Zelik, and it was just clear, you know, there just not, wasn't energy okay. to do it. And I think at some point we just have to accept that, um, you know, there just isn't, the planets aren't lined up for new rules. Mm -hmm. And I distinguish that from, uh, or I should say, I don't equate that with, as some do, that because there isn't an active negotiation, that the whole system is collapsing. The agreements don't expire. The mm -hmm. agreements, for the most part, continue to be upheld by most WTO members. And yes, in my humble opinion, it's a lost opportunity if we can't advance those rules to the next level. Yes, absolutely, it's a missed opportunity. But it's not a collapse of the system, in my view. And I think we have to accept, especially in this time where, you know, let's face it, the winds of unilateralism and inwardness are blowing harder now than they were a decade ago. Um, uh, Kissinger, you know, his book a couple years ago now is very present, uh, his book World Order, where he said, look, you just have to accept that, you know, these things wax and wane, and mm -hmm. multilateralism is in fashion for a while, and then people, its, its deficiencies become clear, and people say, yeah, we need to sort of, you know, look inward, and then people look inward for a while, and they realize, deficiencies with that system and we will once again I believe recognize the importance of having these these multilateral approaches but I will say even until then uh, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the WTO agreements today don't expire and for the most part are abided by. Bruce Chand. So um, just on that question because I, I think this is this is the pivotal question right and first let me just give a plug to my podcast partner who had a great line in The Economist last week where she wrote, the Trump administration so far is all stick and no carrot, mm -hmm. right? And so this is the fundamental problem. If we're thinking about what the approach is with China, we don't right. yet have that you know, on-ramp of negotiations to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yes. And my concern is I agree the WTO agreements aren't gonna expire, but right now we have a ticking clock on this non-market economy issue. This thing is getting litigated in Geneva. This is essentially a political issue. The Chinese want market economy status. We don't want to give it. The Europeans don't want to give it. Somebody's going to lose this case. The solution to this thing has got to be a negotiated outcome mm -hmm. right. where we develop Good new test. rules to deal with this. Yeah. And yet we haven't started down that path yet. And I don't think this is going to happen through you know, a, a bunch of panels and appellate body decisions. So that's the big concern is mm -hmm. that the clock is ticking on some of these critical issues that are confronting us right now without a, a, an off ramp in sight. Could I just make one clarification? Sure. I was re responding to your question about 
a multilateral negotiation yes. as opposed to obviously we have a lot of bilateral negotiating to do with, with China on yeah. some yes. present problems. Fair enough. Bruce? And, and that was actually one of the points that I, I was going to make that, you know, while it, it's pretty clear that at the WTO, uh, it's very hard under the best of circumstances to advance the ball in negotiations that, you know, as I was noting earlier, there are other fora that we could be acting in that would be effective. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even in the context of, of NAFTA, if the modernized NAFTA is completed and includes, uh, a, you know, sta a state owned enterprise disciplines that are really cutting edge, mm -hmm. then that will be a, will be a start. But mm -hmm. ultimately, it, you know, it will be necessary to expand out, you know, from these bilaterals, whether through TPP or some other means, to a point where you have a critical mass yes. that it influences China either directly or because the dynamic in Geneva changes. Fascinating. Well, one more thread to pull from the previous panel, and it was Claire's comment about when you get into actually taking trade retaliatory actions, or you, you suspend concessions for whatever reason. Uh, Claire made the, the quiet observation, but very profound, that China is highly efficient at implementing uh, these kinds of retaliatory actions. Now, we have a president who's, uh, I guess the famous quote was, tariffs, bring me tariffs. And it uh, uh, le leads me to believe we're going to get there at some point. But I also recall the political economy in the U.S. is one where retaliation is really, really a sensitive matter for the firms who are uh, involved in, in, that, in that enterprise. I, as an, an, again, as a recovering lobbyist, I remember spending about a month, basically full time, trying to get an item off a retaliation list uh, because it was unique. We didn't have a other source for it. It was under patent protection. I don't forget, remember all the details, mm -hmm. but I knew my management didn't want that on the list. <laughs> and we are not, and long story short, we're not a very efficient retaliator. So when we get into this, what happens? How does this play out? And what do you expect? Bruce, you want to start with sure. that? Sure. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, th that's one of the critical questions, really, because, uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons why, if we go down the tariff route, it, it'll be problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, one, will we be actually able to go down the tariff route for right. the reasons that you identified? Uh, you know, the big difference from the, from the 80s is, is, again, just how integrated the economy is and how integrated supply chains are. It was difficult in the 80s to identify retaliation targets that would not harm U.S. economic interests. And that's going to be far more difficult to do <coughs> given the nature of the integrated economy. So even mm -hmm. being able to, to do that. Um, but in terms of the reaction that we would get from it, again, if we, if we go down a route which is WTO inconsistent, mm -hmm. then um, we will give China an opportunity to rally um, others against us. We won't have uh, cooperation from others. And um, as we've mentioned, you know, they have a lot of levers uh, to, to hit back. On the other hand, if we're a bit more nuanced about it and we, we do hit some of these areas that might be WTO consistent, whether it's some sort of restrictions on export of technology or investments mm -hmm. or, or government procurement, it's going to be a lot more difficult uh, yeah. for them to react that way and we might be able to hang on to our allies. Mm -hmm. You know, one, when, the, when the, the case was initiated, Ambassador Lighthizer, you know, and he said it a few times, he's not excluded the possibility of going to the WTO. Yes. And um, if he chooses with at least some elements to do so, the odds are quite good that he would have allies, he'd have Japan and he'd have the EU with us, and mm -hmm. that would be a lot more effective. Sure. But that will depend on, you know, the um, WTO plus element being one that others can, can live with. Yes. Chad, John, comments? Uh, so I guess maybe I'd make two points, and this is also maybe in a slight um, disagreement or, or different interpretation than what Ambassador Froman um, was talking about earlier this morning about the, the China 421, because my recollection of the, the China 421 was that it didn't actually, I mean, it was an action that we took, might have been legal, it was subsequently ruled legal as a WTO fine, it had a relatively small economic impact, but led to immediate Chinese retaliation yes. uh, on you know, chicken feet and autos. And, um, and, and it was blatant, and it was ultimately ruled to be a violation of the WTO, but it stayed in place for you know, a couple of years. And so China mm -hmm. is very effective at retaliating in, in ways that, that, that can hurt, as, as Claire also indicated more recently with South Korea and that. But this is an important issue, and we've already seen it come up 
yes. in the context of this year, not with China, but in the context of the 232. Um, you know, the Europeans, when they were very worried in, in July that, that they were going to roll out just a broad-based set of tariffs, said if this happens, we're going to hit, you know, bourbon from Kentucky and, and, and Florida mm -hmm. orange juice and dairy from Wisconsin. Uh, the Canadians at various points in time on, on um, softwood lumber and, and Bombardier have, you know, articulated explicit retaliation threats. So this is just part and parcel of the, the world in which we're living in right now and, and has to be treated, I think, very seriously. Mm -hmm. John, can you comment on the level of finesse that would be required uh, to pull this off? Because we've talked about these tensions uh, in, in the domestic economy, the, the, and the, the degree to which value chains are, are making it more difficult to find items to retaliate. We're talking about, about ways to unite our allies in this or, or, or like-minded members uh, versus alienating them. Uh, this is harder than it looks in a lot of ways, if you could comment on that. Yeah, it would require a lot of finesse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, you know, it, it's, um, you know, it's not a coincidence that trade issues typically dealt with the simple issues of, you know, negotiating tariffs down and quotas and other sort of at the border um, uh, descriptions discrimination really, of discriminating mm -hmm. foreign goods versus domestic goods. You know, many of the things we're talking about now really go to the core of what is the role of government. Yes. And um, different countries have different notions of what the role of government is. Um, and they will not readily, the, you know, those views didn't just emerge out mm -hmm. of the blue. Right. And they have a history and presumably they have political legitimacy and support. And it's unrealistic to think that, you know, the best trade negotiator uh, uh, in the U.S. or Brussels or anywhere is going to magically transform an economy mm -hmm. uh, and refashion it in a way that we think is more uh, consistent with ours. That said, I think there has to be an appreciation on the other side that the status quo is just not, a, it's just not I think, politically sustainable. Yeah. So we're, so. I, I do have a, a confidence, to be perfectly honest, that while there will be, I'm sure, lots of um, uh, turbulence, I think, uh, and that turbulence probably is necessary, mm -hmm. um, ultimately the, there, is, there will be an appreciation that the status quo has to move, but that we both benefit from, uh, from uh, the economies being integrated. Right. Well, thank you. Uh, I want to turn to the audience for questions. Three simple rules. We get started. Thanks for lots of hands. First, wait for the microphone. That way our online audience will hear you. Second, uh, tell us who you are and who you are, uh, your organization. And third, make sure your question's in the form of a question. So we'll start right here. So. Thank you. Peter Rasher from AICGS at Johns Hopkins. Question is mostly directed at Chad. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, in the beginning of the panel, you mentioned the fact that the EU is updating its trade defense instruments and the fact that the U.S. still has, some on, you know, has a number on the books. This is sort of in the context of what's going on with the uh, Chinese case and the WTO about uh, in the context of whether or not the EU is going to grant China market economy status. But then later you said this is really the crux of the matter, this whole issue of, of, of MES. So, Sort of, wh where does where's the balance lie? Should we be more concerned about the uh, effect on the legitimacy of the WTO if China wins that case, or more concerned about the effectiveness of uh, U.S. and EU trade defense instruments if it wins that case? Uh, so my concern is is if either side wins the case. I think the the bigger concern, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> exactly. It's um, lose lose. Yes. Uh, you know, I think my bigger concern is is uh, if the United States loses its case because you know I think the the, the Trump administration has has um, signaled more strongly that they uh, pay less attention to the benefits of the WTO than China would. Cataclysmic, um, I think, is the word. Yeah. Used. Yes. But my bigger concern is that. Even, even if we, the United States, the Europeans, win the legal arguments in this case, this doesn't set China down the path in any productive way of becoming more market-oriented. So we either need to redesign the tools to recognize the fact that China's not like us, to help reduce some of these tensions, 
that are going to inevitably be there to come up with a new system maybe of trade remedies and enforcement to deal with that, or to create the carrots to want to induce China to become more like us in the market economy sense. But that's, to my mind, as an economist, what the, what the critical question is confronting the, the, the international trading system. And we're not there yet in terms of having an actual discussion about that issue. And since this dispute is going on, it's kind of kicking the can down the road in terms of what the, what the big underlying issue is in my mind. Ambassador Smith. And then we'll question in the back. My, my Just a second. second. Hang on for the microphone. Thank you. Uh, I'm struck by the fact that the panel has not talked about the current problem we have within our administration about trade. We have, as far as can be seen, a president who wants to take us out and not encourage us in. What are we going to do about that? Mm -hmm. Fair enough. I think that's the John. third panel. Yes, I, 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 yeah, we'll cover that in the third panel. No, but well, it's it's a it's a it's an it's an excellent question and one that has a, it's very difficult to answer. Partly because the, if I use an electronics term, the signal to noise ratio is not where we'd like it uh, for it to get a clear signal. But partly because the first at least the first year of this administration has been, I think, I'd characterize it as a lot of bark but not many bites yet. And uh, so I, I'm a, at least personally as an observer uncertain how this will actually play out. Uh, we have a, uh, in, in other aspects of policy, we have a president who takes, often takes a, a very extreme position and then allows himself to be moved back. It's kind of what you'd expect from a real estate uh, negotiator, uh, but uh, it's, it's hard to actually detect a pattern yet. I, I don't know if others have a view. Well, uh, I may have been too subtle, but I, I do recall in my brief remark saying that there's a danger of playing trade up rhetorically to present it as though it is trade policy is the reason there are towns in the Midwest that aren't thriving. Um, I think that is an overstatement, gross overstatement of the power of trade policy. And uh, I think there is great danger in attributing the top five problems in America to trade in the way that uh, the rhetoric sometimes does. And the only thing I would add to that, and I agree with that completely, the only thing that I would add is um, what's been, I think, perhaps effective by some of our trading partners, and again, the Europeans in this retaliation threat instance, is to articulate to the administration that if they withdraw from trade, meaning they start to impose import restrictions in a way that would violate you know, basic WTO commitments, there are costs to doing that. And the costs are going to be to US exporters and the workers for those companies that want to sell things into those markets. And to try to explain what those costs are going to be ahead of time before the initial trade policy happens, maybe to stop that initial action from happening. This question in the back. Yes. I'm Bill Reinsch with Kelly Dry and Warren. One of the advantages of sitting in the back is you get to check your phone occasionally, and it's telling me that while we've been sitting here, the ministerial has failed to renew the two bans on e-commerce duties and on non-violation, nullification, and impairment IP cases. Um, with respect to the latter, the NVNI cases, I, my question is, doesn't that really play into the administration's 301 strategy by giving them a new tool or a new opportunity that they can use to attack Chinese policies that they've previously been precluded uh, from attacking, and doesn't that make more work for John? Go ahead, go ahead. Yes. And Bill, I have business cards if you if you lost mine. <laughs> but it's clearly, we've we, we we we've shrunk 301A and expanded 301B to go back to Chuck's original. Now, oh, okay, there we go. Well, but, I mean, in, in a certain sense, you know, watching this over the last few days, it's been interesting to, to see their reluctance to agree to that moratorium. Um, and there's a, a positive way of viewing that, which is that they do see value in WTO dispute settlement, and they do want to have this tool available in that context. Um, but, you know, again, you know, as Scott mentioned, we're in the early days of actually seeing execution of, of many of these tools which they've invoked initially, and so we'll, we'll have to see. We have time for one final question, if there is one. 
Can I try to at least sure. interpret yeah. this discussion for the non-lawyer lawyers Please. to make sure yeah. that we're on? Because that's the, most the, of our audience so, here. Yeah. <laughs> so is the understanding, is my understanding correct that by doing this, so non-violation cases at the WTO, it's basically saying, you know, there's not really explicit rules about this thing that you're doing that we don't like, but it abrogates some of the benefits that we thought we expected to receive. And so historically, we've been hesitant to try to trigger this particular language in different contexts because it's hard to win these kinds of cases, presumably. But by suggesting that maybe they would push a case like this forward, that this might mean they'd actually be a little bit more aggressive and go sort of against what Ambassador Froman is saying, maybe we're going to bring on some of those cases that we're not 90% sure we're going to win. We may only be 50% sure that we're going to win. But at least we're using the WTO to pursue the action and not unilaterally. And, and to spell it out a little bit more, um, there's a provision in the TRIPS agreement and the IP agreement that provides for this remedy, this idea that you can bring a case even if there's not a specific provision in the agreement which has been violated, if you know, the benefits of that agreement are being nullified, uh, undermined by an action which isn't necessarily covered by the agreement. And under the IP agreement, under the TRIPS agreement, um, there's been a, um, it was scheduled to go into effect after a certain number of years. But for the past 10, 15 years, whenever that was, a moratorium has been placed in effect and it has been traded off with a second moratorium and that is one that we've always wanted, which is that no one would place duties on electronic commerce. Mm -hmm. And we've always been willing to make that trade in the past uh, because we've highly valued e-commerce and weren't really sure whether we could use this non-violation provision in TRIPS. But the current administration is, is obviously taking a different calculus there. So I, I, I would just add as a, as a final point, I, I mean, I think the main, uh, at a, as a factual matter, and, and Chad interpreted um, the, the, the lawyerly dialogue quite accurately, this is an opportunity to uh, makes things a little bit easier to bring a WTO case, but I, I think what we're seeing from this administration through words and I suspect soon through action is a willingness to use unilateral tools as the way to get leverage to negotiate outcomes. Yeah. That I think is the new terrain we're in that's mm -hmm. different from before. Yeah. Helpful, thanks. Yeah, we have a final question from our host, uh, Matty McEvin. Thanks, unless I really wanted to give someone else a chance, but if there are no other hands, then I will ask, sort of following up on that, I said this panel should do a little prognosis. So, um, so supposing we, in the next week or month or you know soon, uh, the administration announces a 301 action, a section 301 action that, uh, whether illegal, not illegal, causes China to retaliate against some of our uh, uh, companies, our exporters or investors in China. Um, what happens next? What's, what's the next play? Uh, what do you think is going to happen? What should happen uh, next if that happens in that scenario? Well, at, at the risk of, of um, appearing naive uh, and Pollyannish, I, I think there's an, there's an interim step in your question, Matt. If, if the U.S., it depends how the U.S frankly, threatens unilateral action. If it does it full-throated in a bold way, then that's the kind of response you, we should expect from a trading partner who uh, will be concerned about its own appearance. If, on the other hand, there is a, a more subtle, uh, quiet, uh, but clear expression that we are prepared to move in the following way, namely in a unilateral way that will hurt you, yes, you'll hurt us, and we'll be in a soup that is beneficial to neither side, then I think there's a potential for a negotiation. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, let's, let's face it, there hasn't been leverage for the past decade. And I don't mean that as a criticism of the no. last administration, um, any more than I mean as a criticism of, of the administration that I was part of. I mean, we brought the first WTO case against China. It was on a VAT. It was fairly clear that we would win the case, and they settled it. You know, it was one of those rare cases where they settled it during the, during the consultation period. But I think, I think no one in Washington or Beijing two years ago or 10 years ago seriously thought the U.S. would use unilateral tools. Mm -hmm. And as a result, 
there was, you know, uh, without much leverage, you get what, you, what you'd expect, which is not a lot of movement. And I think for good or bad, that dynamic is shifting. And um, we will see if it's done subtly, it may move things in a productive way. If it's done not so subtly, things could deteriorate. And I, I as, as, um, as someone once said, predictions, especially about the future, are difficult, so I'll refrain. But we're, we're at least in a new environment where if I had ever gone to Bob Zellick as the general counsel and said, I think we should consider unilateral action, I, he would have just thrown me out because it, would, it was just beyond the pale. And now it's no longer beyond the pale. Hmm. That's uh, probably a good place to leave it. Leave it. Uh, we, uh, first, thank you. Thank you for spending your morning with us, particularly you non-trade people. Welcome to our world. But uh, <laughs> thanks for being here. And join me in thanking our panel. Thank you.